Hello folks and welcome to the first Our Game Show of 2023. Vernie, we've been waiting a few weeks for this, we're delighted to be back. And just a reminder, we're brought to you by rstore.ie. If you want to get any of the official merchandise from Our Game, go to rstore.ie. There's great stuff there from all the different counties. You might see behind me there, that little custom cork one, Hoggy, Jimmy, Johnny and Ringy. Bit of an old throwback to that famous Beatles t-shirt. How are things, Mikey? Good to be back, Shano. But the new year, I expected a new you and I expected a beardless Shane Stapleton. <laughs> Look, I mean, can we not just build up to that? Do, does it have to be straight away, first show, I come in with a clean baby face? Well, it's like this. I wouldn't normally grow... Tell people whatever. why. I wouldn't normally grow whatever I'm growing here, but I wanted a contrast between my uh, over uh, overly hairy face and your hairless face because you lost the Our Game Christmas quiz uh, before Christmas uh, disgustingly for you, you were unable to recall the minor final scoreline in which you beat Offaly in. Do you remember it now, actually? I would be interested. Yeah, I do, 116 to 117. Good man, okay. I love the way you put the losing score first, which no one would ever do. Yeah, well, like, I was very close to getting it right. I said 216 to 217. Um, but yeah, I keep the best to last there, having the win and scoreline last. But you know what? Maybe that's enough for me with the All-Ireland title in the bag. You can have your quiz. I'll shave off my beard next Monday. No problem at all. You know when you know when Homer shaves in The Simpsons and he, you know the brown bit that he normally has is gone completely and it just looks completely different. I If the show is starting at, say, half 12 on Monday, I want you to have shaved at like 12.25. I want it to be like as raw as it could be because you're one of these boys where you shave at nine o'clock that morning and you have that shadow at half It's 12. not true. It's not true. This takes really? me weeks to grow. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, no, okay. I'd be baby face for days after. That's the Honestly, job. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, we have a few comments coming in already, so we'll just have a look at those. Keep them coming throughout the show. We're going to have a little bit of a quiz for the viewers at some point. We're going to be talking about our three wishes for the year, players that we think will stand out, uh, comeback players for 2023, lots of stuff like that. Grodo Gregon says, we'll see how this ages, but predictions for this year are clear to win the Senior Hurling, Ch Hurling Championship, Kerry Senior Football Championship, uh, Cork Senior Camogie Championship, and Donegal to win the Ladies Championship as well. We'll be making our predictions too. Uh, Jack Nolte says, early season wouldn't take anything seriously yet, but good win for Cork and uh, over Kerry, and they're only back. Yes, a few goals, but uh, league will be more telling. Uh, Sean O'Sullivan, he says, early season, as you say, hope Cahill is uh, near those Bulmers archers after Tuesday. wonder how uh, how does he like those apples. <laughs> Happy New Year, all, says Jared Pickering Jr. Afternoon, gentlemen, says John Collins. Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year, all, says Jack Nulty. So Happy New Year to all our viewers, indeed. So we will be getting to that. But um, the first thing that you wanted to talk about on the dock was some interesting comments on uh, from Davy Burke. Now he was uh, he did a he did a show for us last year with End of Early, and it was brilliant stuff. Just uh, talking about all the football. He's after taking over at Ross Common, but he's made some interesting comments, hasn't he? Yeah, well, he's Davy's never one to uh, you know shark any opinions he has or pull any punches. But he's which talking we love. About, yeah, yeah, which we love is right, yeah. And he's talking about um, talking about the search for consistency and. To me, reading it, it looks like he's taken a fair old poke at his predecessor, Anthony Cunningham. But I'll just read out the direct quotes here. Uh, it's huge, uh, Burke said, when he's talking about their search for consistency. It's the single biggest thing. It stems from training, the consistent levels of training. Whatever you do on a Tuesday and a Thursday, you'll do it on a Sunday. I'm a firm believer in that. I'm never looking for 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 uh, because you can't replicate it. You can't do it again the next day. Just give me seven and a half out of 10 every day and I'll take that. You'll win a huge amount of games because I know then that on Sunday this team is going to turn up uh, at this level and play this week and we'll be right there against the majority of teams. So basically, what he, he went on further even to talk about how he feels like their trend has been up and down, up and down like a roller coaster, a high on a Tuesday, a low on a Thursday and maybe you know mid-range on a Sunday. So he's talking about the lack of consistency and you'd see that they have had maybe topsy-turvy seasons and different parts of seasons that have been high followed by a low but he's looking for that consistent graph the whole way through and I suppose a big part of that will be trying to retain their division one status it's funny um I I anecdotally know a fella uh, that's associated with Ross Common or is from Ross Common and you know his biggest uh you know bugbear with Davy Burke already is the fact that he talks in the media quite a bit. Um, and like that's something that people are probably going to have to get used to because in fairness to Davy and from our point of view, it's great. Davy will take a call. Davy will 
you know, do interviews and he won't, he's no problem answering any questions or anything like that. But it's going to be fascinating to see how he gets on there. It's obviously, it's a decent step up from being over Wicklow and he had good success with Wicklow, getting them promoted and then retaining their promotion like, or retaining their status. I think at, at year uh, year expense one year in a, in a kind of a relegation semi-final or something like that. But it's going to be interesting to see how he takes that step up to Division 1. And uh, he's obviously uh, involved in Minute as well, who won their first Division 1 league title too. So it's going to be fascinating to see how he gets on. And Davey, as I said, you can guarantee Davey won't be pulling any punches and he'll tell it as is. If they're brilliant, he'll say that. If they're not so good, he'll, he'll go into fair detail about that and why that is as well. A couple of things. Number one, you know, when he did the coaching clinic a few months back for us in our game, he was very much like, you know, he wouldn't be one of these trying to be secretive about, you know, this is how we train and, and keep that a trade secret. He was very much like the best way to evolve and improve is for coaches to trade ideas. So I don't think he's, he'd ever go down the route of being a closed book, which is brilliant. And then another thing is, you know, the way in the past you'd hear certain coaches talking about how we were flying during the week and we couldn't understand, you know, how the performance was so poor. So maybe that tallies with what he's saying. But then other times you hear about how we were flying in training or a certain player was flying in training. I'm thinking Shane O'Donnell, 2013 All-Ireland. And then that's kind of a portent of things to come in the real match. So it's hard to know what's, you know, what's actually right. I mean, obviously you do want consistency in training, but sometimes you can be flying in training and then go out into a match and it really does lead to a massive performance. And you can kind of, you know, it's true that you saw it in training, but like, I don't know if there's a magic formula for, for this. And sometimes you just can't explain a, a performance, good or bad. No, and sometimes I think you're, I totally agree there. And when, when a player is coming to that boil, you can see it. I, I've been involved with teams and you can just see someone is coming to the boil. They're really, really coming to form. And they're, that might only last two weeks. It might last six weeks. It might last two months or whatever. But you can see that it's like I'm heavily involved in horses, as you know, Shane. You can see trainers and say, I've seen something different. They're coming back to themselves. And when you see that, uh, you just you have to play those, you play those players and mm. play them for as long as you can. But there's a real balancing act there between we were flying during the week and we went over the top. And that is a re that, and do you know what I mean by that? As in we were flying. I never forget. Uh, uh, there was a team involved. They were building up to the preparations for a junior county final, and they played a game in training about about a week beforehand, and it was so good that they, they, they kept going after 60 minutes. The players were loving it, kept going and going. It went on for the guts of about 90 minutes, and it was unbelievable. And they, you know, everyone was talking about how good the standard was. Played the final the, the week after. Now, they won it, but they scraped over the line because they left a lot of it on the training field. And you'd hear horse trainers in particular saying, a lot of them would say, we don't want to leave our performances on the gallop. So I think so you, you pull all, them up early. Yeah, you always have to... And I think they played. I think they played in Leinster after, and it was something similar. Uh, the week before the game, they played about a twenty-minute game. Do you know what I mean? Because I, it's a, it's a tough one because players want to go that bit more, but you have to leave that bit of juice in the tank for the day. You have to leave that freshness and eagerness on the day. You don't want to leave it all on the pitch. So that's a yeah. difficult balancing act. Um, so Mark Keane is going to play wing back for Cork against Kerry, and it's just nine days before Bally Gilblin playing All Ireland final against Eski. Now, from his point of view, you can understand why he'd want to be lining out. And assuming he comes through it and has a good game, he's played at a great intensity level. I mean, compared with playing an All-Ireland Junior Final, you'd imagine. I think that's fair to say without anyone taking a fit of the vapours. Um, so if he comes through it, it's good. He's playing centre-back with Bally Giblin the last few years, so it's similar-ish position. And from his, from his point of view, having been used in the forwards last year, they're obviously trying to find a different position for him. And, you know, six foot four, whatever he is, a serious athlete it kind of makes sense in a way of playing him in that position so there's a lot of positives assuming he comes through but then like i think of last year when willie connors played for tipperary in the monster hurling league breaks his ankle and then he can't line out for balana he's a Kiladangan man and last year Kiladangan didn't have a football team so he missed out on balana's run in munster at the time so there is that sort of risk if he gets injured you know there's a bit of a fallout oh i think it's a massive risk Shane. i have to say um, nine days before a club final that he might never play in again. Now, it's, there's a lot of mitigating circumstances here. Uh, we were chatting to Shane Kingston before Christmas. I don't think, I think Mark Keane is the only one of the Cork squad who hasn't, uh, who hasn't trained under Pat Ryan in some guise, be it senior when he was coach or under 20s when he was coach uh, and now manager again. So I think Mark Keane is one of the only ones. So of all the players that have to impress 
he's probably the one unknown. So I would say that's probably why he's playing, and he's obviously tr- been tried out in a new position as well. But I think it's a, I think it's, uh, I think it's a big risk. I won't, I won't lie. Um, mm. Nine days before a final, imagine. I hope to God something doesn't happen. Um, and you can say they're only playing Kerry, which I think is, I, I don't put any credence into that at all. A, a game is a game, wasn't it? Against Kerry that Willie Connors, funny enough, yeah. did his injury last year. Not funny yeah. enough at all. There was nothing funny about it. But uh, it doesn't matter who you're playing. If it's a competitive game, you can pick up a knock. Um, the, probably the more competitive, probably the more likely. But uh, I do think it's a big risk. And if I was the, the Bally Giblin manager, I'd be pulling my hair out a small bit. Yeah, and I've plenty of people who like to drive the boot into Tipperary telling me, well, like, if you think about it, uh, Kerry are the fifth best team in Munster these days. No doubt you'll be trying to sew that boot into me. I just look at the, the Cork team that's playing against Kerry. Jared Collins, brother of Patrick Collins in goals. Sean O'Donoghue, who's the captain this year. Niall O'Leary's fullback alongside Owen Roach. And then Mark Keane, who we've mentioned. Tommy O'Connell, who's a lovely, graceful hurler. And Rob Downey out at wing back. Ethan Toomey, who's a big, young hope from St. Finbar's alongside Sam Quirk. Brian Roach, Conor Lehan, and Cormac Bosang. And Alan Cadigan is back in as a starter, along with Declan Dalton and Shane uh, Kingston. And just a quick look through the bench as well. Patrick Collins, Kieran Joyce, Cormac O'Brien, Sean O'Leary Hayes, Brian O'Sullivan, Ben Cunningham, obviously son of Jerry Cunningham, Shane Barrett, Colin Walsh of uh, Canturk. He's brother of Aidan Walsh, isn't he? Yeah, he is indeed, yeah. Yeah, Conor Cahillan, Luke Mead, and Patrick Horgan is there as well. So, um Definitely some fresh faces, but some people that we'd be fairly uh, familiar with as well. Surely Pat Ryan would only play him for the first half. Yeah, maybe. I I, I kind of don't think it matters really because he could pick up an injury in the first minute as he could in the you not know, sixty eight minute or whatever. I just think it's a it's a funny one. Um, another one as well. The Collins is is a real peculiar one, isn't it? Like, uh, are they twin brothers or just brothers? No, they're brothers. They're, I don't yeah. think they're twins at all. But fighting, but fighting for the one spot is. Like that must be good out of crack. There's no point. Say, no, point no that would be different. horrible, actually. Yeah, well, like that's why I mean. I mean that in a, probably facetiously enough. Like they're they would probably cut each other's throats to get in at different stages. Like, and they're fighting for the one spot. There's only going to be one person in the house happy, uh, and you can say you're happy for your brother, but you want to be playing. There's no point in saying any different. If you and Paddy were going for the one spot, uh, and first I put in the caveat, if you were of similar ability. <laughs> <laughs> um, like you'd be sick if he was playing and you're not playing. That's just the nature of it. And you'd be part of you would be happy for him, but like you, like they're fighting for the one spot. Um, and it's just it's a it's an awkward situation, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um. Actually, while we're talking about that game, we might as well talk about Pat Bennett talking about Kerry's turnover of players. And he was saying for us to get into Monster where we want to be, we have to win a Joe McDonough. Uh, no one will give it to us. At some stage, we'll have to go and win a Joe McDonough. People say this was your third Joe McDonough final. It's not. We spoke to the panel there last week. Out of a panel of 44, only six of them played the three Joe McDonoughs. If you go to the two Joe McDonoughs, there's only maybe 11 who played two finals. Out of a panel of 44, that's only a quarter. This is a whole new job, a new season starting for us, These guys, uh, for these guys to win a Joe McDonough. But again, as I said, it is so competitive and so hard. You have to get everything right. And you know, um, obviously, that's that's a bit further down the track at this stage, but even looking at the teams that are in the Joe McDonough, Carlo, Down, Kildare, Leash, Offaly, Kerry. It's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, it's going to be a belter when we get, when we get into a prediction for who's going to win the Joe McDonough. Like, Kerry mightn't get back to the final this year, uh, despite having been beaten in the last three. There's a distinct possibility. The one thing I would say about Pat talks about the turnover there, like, a lot of the really key bodies are still there. Uh, Fiona McAsee, uh, Daniel Collins, the two boils, Jordan Conway, who hopefully will stay fully fit for the whole year. Shane mm. Conway, obviously, as well. So the bulk of the team is still there. Eric Lean, um, they still have the bulk of a very good squad. I think key to it is the 11 that are still there are real kind of mainstays of the team, or the vast majority are. Yeah, uh, I might as well bring up uh, the Kerry team here, seeing as we're talking about them. Um, hurling one to three forces, interestingly, Cork have 17 out of the 26. They played against Galway last year on their 26 against Kerry. So I'll just bring up that Kerry team here and we'll have a quick look at it. Uh, so John B. O'Halloran, Conor O'Keefe, Mikey Boyle, Evan Murphy, Kyle O'Connor, Fionn McAsee at centre back, and Sean Weir, midfield of Michael Lean and Killian Trant, Jordan Conway, who you talked about there, Colin Walsh and Shane Conway, and an inside line of Gavin Dooley, Podge, Boyle, and Daniel Collins. So pretty strong team, actually. A lot of very familiar faces there. Uh, the next thing we wanted to talk can I about... Ask you, can I ask you quickly, yeah. right? Um, and I'm Because I'm kind of intrigued by this. Um, do you think it was important, and it, I, 
we we'll talk about uh, Cork and Kerry in this context as well. Like, do you think it was important for Davy, shall we say, to win his first game as Waterford manager? And do you think it's important for Pat Ryan to not get people on side from the start, but like they're more likely to go strong and try to get wins under their belt? If you get me and get, get the whole feel good factor moving, or am I wrong in thinking that? Um, I don't know. I mean, like. Let's say a defeat at this time of the year only matters if it's uh, compounded by other defeats a little bit later on. So, for example, Colin Bonner losing to Kerry yeah. didn't matter this time last year until later on when it started to become part of the case file for why this wasn't going well. So, you know, like Davy Fitz getting a win at the start, brilliant. Like we know they're training unbelievably hard and they're sort of doing fairly um, extended sessions at the weekend. And... Uh, but at the same time, does it matter to Liam Cahill losing the other night, even though he'd probably have more regulars out on the field than Davy did uh, with, with what was Cahill's former team? So it's probably only later on that we'll truly decide. But also there's the manner of defeat. So, yeah, Tipperary weren't brilliant the other night. We'll come to that in a little while. But they were down to, what was it, 14 men for maybe the last 12 minutes of normal time plus mm -hmm. injury time. So when you look at it in that context... But we'll come back to that in a little bit of time, but, uh, and we'll be talking about all of these managers. But I suppose just to go through some of the, the people who've retired in the last couple of weeks, we'll say, and then a few more that, you know, Lee Keegan is the obvious one, where Kevin McStay is hopeful that he'll stay on. Yeah, um, there's, there's loads of different bits and pieces here. There's obviously things, a lot of things happen over the Christmas. Uh, there's been two Monaghan retirements. I thought this was interesting. Uh, Monaghan put up like a picture tweet I'd nearly call it but a picture Colin Walsh and Drew Wiley uh, saying that both had retired before Monaghan played down last night and they said uh, statements to follow I haven't seen a statement now since but they're two you know serious warriors for for the Farney army they're they've uh, they've stepped aside so Vinnie Corey will be without them uh, for 2023 David Tuberty obviously retired as well uh, the highest score in league football history that's some stat to have beside your name yeah. um he never played as my colleague in the independent said in Wednesday's paper he never played against Johnny Cooper but they their careers kind of uh coincided with each other shall we say but there are two two serious contrasts David Tuberty operating uh particularly at the early stages of his career down in division four division three and like lottery division two the last good few seasons Johnny Cooper operating uh in division one seven all Irelands you know uh, I'd say his, his Leinster count is in double figures right. as well. Yeah, I just think there's a great contrast bet between the two of them. Uh, on Tuberty, it was just seemed to me he was a guy that was, I mean, this is such a compliment. He was always playing for Clare. You know, like there's guys that miss seasons or miss games or whatever. It seemed to me like he was always playing. He was so consistent on the pitch, but he was consistent at getting to the pitch as well and always been playing. Johnny Cooper probably latterly in recent years maybe was more their sweeper but before that he was one of their one of their best man markers just a real I don't know you can kind of smell or see an intensity off certain players and you just when you look at him you can just see how intense he was on the field I'm sure he brought that off the pitch as well uh, I'd say he probably maybe um saw the writing on the wall a, a small bit. I'd say his body was letting him down a bit uh, in recent years. And I mean that in the, the greatest respect because he was a fantastic defender. Uh, and he really played on the edge and often veered to the other side of that edge. He got two black cards in All-Ireland Finals or uh, definitely got the black card with Clifford. Or was he sent... Sorry, he was sent off that day. Yeah. And uh, he got a black card, didn't he, in another All-Ireland Final against Mayo, I think. Fairly sure he did. So someone might comment in and let us yeah. know there. But yeah, and apparently someone who I saw one of his former teammates talk about how he was very much a player who set the standard in the dressing room. And you need lads like that. If you're going to have a serious culture, you need lads to drive it so that other lads will will, will follow suit. Uh, I saw a comment here, John Collins. That quiz before Christmas was as good as the darts final. Serious level of answer. Number one, you can look up the quiz. It's it's on the YouTube channel there. But did you watch Michael Smith against Michael Van Gerwen in the darts final? And them both going for nine darters in, I think, the second set. It was unbelievable. I'll tell you what, uh, I don't have the channels, and normally I wouldn't, but I... Uh, you can only have poverty one and two. Yeah, I don't watch much telly, been honest with you, outside of games and stuff. But I ended up uh, I ended up in the Sporting Emporium in uh, in Dublin the other night, playing a Stop bit of blackjack. Parties. Playing a bit of blackjack. Uh, as a, as a little Christmas treat to myself, and I ended up, uh, I ended up seeing the darts. I've never seen 
anything like it. That is the greatest. Like there's, you know, you go. I end up. I often end up going down through dark rabbit holes of, is this the greatest leg of all time? You see it as the the headline of the story. But that was like to actually for one lad to have a chance and miss it, and for the other lad, like I thought, I was so impressed with how Smith dealt with all the emotion of Van Gerwen missing his nine darter. And like it, the easiest thing to do there is miss the first treble. Like, so easy to do. And uh, he nailed, I think it was, uh, Van Gerwen had went for a 19 treble before that. So he was 20, 320s, 320s and 12. For his Double 12, Smith yeah. Went, Smith went uh, 20s, 19s and 12. And I tell you something, we talk about this and I was only chatting someone uh, privately about this as well. Michael Smith was the nearly man up until he won the Grand Slam of Arts. Same as so many hurling teams and so many sporting teams. Then all of a sudden, there's this release off his shoulders. He felt very little pressure going into the, the World Championships and he steadily got better and probably produced his best in the final. But it's just amazing when you have that release and the pressure is no longer on internally and externally what you can do on the big occasion. Yeah, I wonder, is, are there many players out there who have gotten to a level like that within a final? Like, and I mean any sport. And, I'm, you know, like, so to hit a nine darter when somebody else has just gone for a nine darter, like you said, to keep the composure, unbelievable. And I'm thinking of players who've done it in big finals, like Zidane scoring that unbelievable volley against Leverkusen. Oh, yeah. in, was it 2001? So uh, what I mean is produce the greatest bit of, I don't know, action that you can possibly produce on the biggest possible stage. Is there anything else that comes to mind? So uh, if any of the viewers out there have any thoughts, that is cool. Even this like even, says, uh, Ninja Hyper 8805 Gaming, come on, boys. Obviously, I, uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder, is he real? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing, uh, the time Zidane, was that in the World Cup final where he did the, what's it called, the Panekes, or how you pronounce it, is it? Who, the, the Czech lad? Uh, no, didn't Zidane do, uh, remember it hit the underside of the cross? Oh, yeah, yeah, game. that was the 6 like, final, yeah. That takes some cojones to do that but to produce something like that in a final and then when he, that that uh that volley against Leverkusen is one of the great final goals was Van Basten's volley in the World Cup final that time or was that Euros final remember the volley from out the corner uh it was the right hand side I think it was against was it against Yugoslavia actually I think it was a final who are you talking about uh Marco Van Basten was that 88 but that was against uh, USSR, as it was called at the time in 1988. Yeah, unbelievable. Like, do you know when they? You know about the original Penenka, though, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was in 1976 at the European Championships. So uh, yeah, like that was the original one. What a beauty! Uh, look, Richard Hogan is saying Euro '88 versus Soviet Union. Yeah. TJ and Ellen the free against Thomas is that like that was. That was absolutely incredible. And in the context of the game, to be able to stand up and deliver. I'd say Tony Kelly, I'd say Tony Kelly's sideline at the end of the Munster final last year was like that as well, where somebody just steps up. Gerard, the 05 Champions League final, he ended up playing like left back in that final, didn't he? And he ended up no. cramping. He did. He went back playing left back. Was that against, uh, that was against AC Milan? AC Milan. He ended mm. up playing left back at one stage. 100%. I'll have my life on it. Yeah. And he ended up cramping in both his grinds as well at that game at one stage. Fair play to him. Fair play. And to Harry Kuehl uh, started and was taken off after about 25 minutes. That's my other takeaway from that game. Harry Kuehl, yeah. But he was only kind of back from injury. Do you remember Steve Finnan had to go off? I think, was it tactical or injury? He went off at half time. Jimmy Traore played in that final. That's right. I mean, mean, that, that was yeah. mad. And it's yeah. funny, because uh, Gerard's final in the performance will be mentioned. It was his goal, was it against Olympiacos, when they needed to yes. go with a group? And then everything just spiraled as a result of that. That's one of those classic uh, sliding doors moments. If you know, if he hadn't scored that, obviously they wouldn't have got out of the group, and we wouldn't be talking about the six-time champions of Europe now. I think, um, but it's nuts how kind of as of because of one event, how a load of other things can happen. This kind of domino effect. Yeah, will we talk about GA for the crack? <laughs> <laughs> I won't mind. I generally don't like soccer at all, but it's funny. I use, I could tell you more about soccer in fifteen or twenty years ago than now, to be honest. Hmm. Um, so uh, Blaine Hughes, he stepped away from the Orchard County panel ahead of the 2023 season. I suppose when you are a goalie and you see that Ethan Rafferty, a converted outfielder who obviously has goalkeeping credentials, is in there in front of you, you probably feel like the way the team is playing, I may not see game time. Now, maybe he has other reasons for it, but um, you know, you, you can kind of understand it too. Uh, Kevin McStay, he's hopeful that Lee Keegan will give it another year at Mayo. I'd say everyone in the county is hoping that, especially with Oshin Mullen gone away. And um, you've already mentioned a couple of the other retirees. 
Eddie Brennan, he's with my car, my Carky Boris for next year. Funny enough, coming back from um, coming back from, I was at a stag in Cork there not so long ago, and the following day, Killer One were playing Bally Gunner. Um, and we decided to stop off in the horse and jockey, which is McCarkey Burroughs territory, on the way back, and went in. And there's only one TV, and the McCarkey Burroughs young lads were watching soccer, and they weren't turning on the hurling, certainly not from the start. So we had to get out of there. So uh, they have a culture it, change needed there, Eddie. Yeah, Eddie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> to be fair, now they've a lot of talent in the last couple of years, and like even la uh, the night before last, Reece Shelley was playing in goals for uh, Tipperary. So they've plenty of talent there. So I think he's Willie point. Ryan in as coach as well. Former, who was former Tip captain, wasn't he? Tommy Var, I think Willie Ryan. Yeah, Willie Ryan Square. <clears throat> okay. And uh, right, it, and then another turn up for the books in terms of um, small ball. Aidan O'Mahony's taken over the Dr. Croke senior hurlers. Yeah, that one definitely took me by surprise anyway. Um, when I saw Dr. Croaks, obviously immediately you're thinking, Jesus, that's a big appointment for the Dr. Croaks footballers who generally I think have always, I think they've been in-house the last good while, Pat O'Shea and, and a few others. Then I saw it was obviously the hurlers. I remember Croaks taking umbrage to something that Anthony Daly wrote a couple of years ago about the promotion of hurling within the club. And, it's, and I remember them coming out quite strong on it after and said that they had like they do try and prioritize it as much as possible and believe that it has been um you know strides made at underage or whatever but it is a kind of a big statement like but I'd imagine like you know one thing being a manager he's gonna have to probably bring in a hurling coach as well so the, the ticket as they call it now will be interesting to see obviously as well um what success in Crocs you're looking at Kilmiley uh Causeway etc who have been the really strong you know hitters within Kerry Hurling, like I can't think of when when are we when are we talking somebody outside of the North Kerry sure. clubs winning a, a Kerry championship? I'd say you have to go back a long, long time. Uh, I don't know if we have both for anybody watching at the moment, but uh, I I don't know when the last time you know one of those North Kerry clubs didn't win it. Yeah, uh, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure which. I'll name some of the recent winners, and I'm not sure of the geographic location of all of them. But Causeway, Kilmoyle, Lichna, Bally Duff. Uh, St. Brendan's Ard Firk, that was 2013. Um, Bally Haig, 2000. Yeah, so um, it's pretty much been those teams in, in recent times anyway. Pretty much yeah. Abbey Dorney, 1974. Uh, so let us know. We're going to have a little bit of a quiz coming up in a second. Uh, first off, there's a question for us from Pwell74. Which GA player would do a Penenka in a Ooh. penalty shooter? I'd say Keane Lynch would probably do one. And I'd say that's why he's asking, because Pwell is obviously Patrick's well. He was an underage soccer star, so I'd say he'd probably have it in him. Yeah, um, I don't know why Peter Duggan comes into my head, but then I think, no, he'd be the exact opposite and he'd bury it at the keeper. Um, I just think, who else would have the... It's not... I don't know if this is a Cajones thing. It This is like just having an unbelievable belief in yourself and almost um, knowing that the keeper is going to overthink what you're going to do at the penalty. Uh, but, like, imagine... You, you could never try it in hurling. And that's why, because you have a hurl in your hand, the goalie can kind of show you kind of both sides and he can block without moving from the middle. So he's not going to really jump to one side or anything like that. What was I watching recently? Um, it was, uh, I think it was the, uh, it was the uh, uh, Fitzgibbon Cup League final and Jason Galan was in goals. And I think he's left-sided. He'd hold the hurl like this. He but, flipped yeah. the hurley over. Yeah, and then last second he flipped the hurley back. Like I don't know if he thought like uh, I forget who was taking the penalty now. Was it Reece Shelley actually? I think it might have been. Who saved the Rhys penalty Shelley. on Tuesday yeah. night? Yeah, it was Reece Shelley, and uh, just thinking he's hardly going to think like looking at him. But maybe it might just looking at him that he's left-handed. But it might just cause that small bit of doubt where you might hit it to the other side or whatever. But I just thought that was interesting. I don't want to be. I don't know if to be too many lads that would that would try that type of penalty in. Uh, in hurling, definitely not. In football, might be a couple in football. Might be yeah. a couple in football. It would be ballsy because if it goes wrong, you're going to get slated. I wonder about the, you know, the, the penalty that's very much in vogue the last few years. You'd see Ivan Tony doing it an awful lot. You'd see Neymar and Messi doing it, where they come up and they're just looking at the goalkeeper, waiting for him to somewhat commit. Um, there's a brilliant video out there somewhere of, I think, uh, Jorginho, the Chelsea guy, take one against Jan Sommer, the Swiss, go a Swiss goalie. And Summer sort of half commits one way and then goes back. So he sort of decided that I'm going to show Jorginho that I've gone one way, committed, but I'm actually going to go the other. And uh, he outfoxed him. It was great. The double bluff. 
Yeah. Love it. Love it. I don't know if Dermot Connolly would have done the Penenka because he used to slam them into the bottom corner when he was hitting them. Remember against Mayo that time? Blasted yeah. into the bottom corner. Would Shane Walsh try one? I, I'd imagine he'd smash it in. I don't think Clifford would try one either. It would just wouldn't be his style. Yeah, you, you're, you're looking for an emphatic finish when it comes to Clifford, aren't you? Yeah, ah, yeah. You're looking at usually kind of one of the top corners, I would say. We talked about before as well the amount of uh, Gaelic football penalty takers that go to their go to their open side that don't cut back across their body. So a right-footed kicker going to the right the right corner, shall we say, and a left-footed kicker going to that corner. They rarely go back across their own body. Soccer players do it obviously way more because they're more proficient at it. Yeah. Uh, comment in from James Daly. Great to have you back, lads. Looking forward to another year of top class stuff from me. You can't be bait. Small ball is back already. Looking forward already to park you in on Sunday week. And delighted to be back as well. And thanks very much to everyone who supports the channel. We're going to do a little bit of a quiz with the viewers. So get your answers in as quick as possible. We're going to read them out in order of, uh, of who comes in first with their answers. So the first one is, who's coaching the Cork senior footballers this year? Now, not the manager. Who's coaching them? Who's the big name coaching there? So we'll give you a couple of seconds and see who comes in with the first answer. Uh, in the meantime, I might just mention that in the O'Byrne Cup, Killian O'Gara, younger brother of former Dublin star Owen, who's playing down in, uh, in Wexford these days. Is it Chameliers he's with? Yep. Yeah. He's, uh, so Owen hit 1-4 as Dublin got their O'Byrne title uh, defence after a winning start against Wicklow last night, 2-15 to 0-9. And it was the first outing for Oshin McConville who took over. Uh, so a couple of people have answered that one. Kevin Walsh, of course, he is the manager of uh, the core footballer. So Jay Quan and ML89 were first in there. Interesting one on that chain, right? So yeah. Yeah. Kevin Walsh is based in Galway and coaching with Cork, coming up a good chunk of the West Coast. Keen O'Neill is based in Cork and coaching with Galway. It's just, it's mad. And like, if you look at the length of, length of the country that Paddy Talley is travelling, um, it's crazy, you know, some of the distances that they're travelling. And it's not usually the manager that's traveling the big distance, unless you're talking about Davey going to Wexford or whatever a couple of years ago. But a lot of time, the coaches are putting up serious mileage. And like, would you over the years have ever had to put up big mileage to get to training? Um, I don't know, when you were Wick with Wicklow or were you ever based elsewhere when you were involved with Offaly? When I was with Offaly, I remember I was doing summer camps uh, and been based in like Garmanstown and Briefy and a couple of these places. Briefy was like a three hour spin back for training or whatever. And like, just like grand, it was grand to get a few quid into the pocket and fill up the car or whatever, which would be absolutely, you, by the time you get home, as well as that, I don't know how the Mayo boys do it as well, because you're buzzing, you're on the road, you have to, unless you're traveling by minibus or whatever, you have to concentrate the whole way home, you have to stay alert, you're not sitting on a couch from half 10 onwards. So I remember Chris Barrett talking about it recently, like his body wouldn't really switch off until one, half one. Then he was mm. up for work at seven the next day because he was traveling from Dublin. Uh, it's so difficult. And I have to say, I hugely admire anybody that does it. But I can also see why Shane Walsh kind of had, maybe had to put his hand up and yell stop as well. Because it does probably take a bit of time off your career. And it not been smart. It, it makes life probably a lot less enjoyable as well. Some people are built for it. Others aren't. I, I would have found I was built for 10 years ago. Whereas now if I drive half an hour, I nearly need to sleep after. It's just funny how your body clock can change as well. Not to mention the price of diesel these days as well. Because um, I remember once, oh, like this is 15 years ago, maybe more, having to travel back from Dunleary where I was working, get the bus all the way into town, get the Lewis down to the train, get the train down to Templemore, get a lift from Templemore to Bursley and be like 10 minutes late to training after three hours of a trek. And Bertie Sherlock looking at me asking, why are you late? Setting a bad example. I'm like, well, I just traveled for three hours to get here. Got off work early. But hey. Do you know what that story sounded like? You know, like the tree in the hole and the bog in the hole and the hole and the hole and the bog down in the valley, you. <laughs> uh, who's the coach of the Down Senior Hurlers this year, this coming season? There's one for the viewers. Who's first oh, one in with that? You have the Down Senior Hurlers. Oh, I know it. I think I do. Yeah, yeah. And while we're waiting for people to answer that, who's, the co who's in coaching, has a coaching involvement with the Fermanagh senior hurling team. And obviously this is someone you would have seen in our, uh, on the Our Game channel a lot in the last couple of years. Try and take this as a double answer, if we can. You have to have the two answers in, and both correct. There, yeah. that, that, that'll get them thinking, all right. First one in. And then who's coaching? Who's a, I'm not sure, is he a performance coach or a coach full-time with the Roscommon senior hurling team? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. 
Performance coach, yeah. Performance yeah. Coach. Uh, hey, Sean O'Sullivan says, it's not the driving, Bernie. It's all the sourdough bread giving you a hangover. That was the time, yeah. The man who doesn't drink but once had sourdough bread. What, there was alcohol in it? No, brioche bread. And it was a full loaf. And I'd say you're probably supposed to maybe at one sit and eat maybe a tenth of the loaf. But I had the full loaf. And maybe I've had, I'd had a couple of rolls with it as well. And uh, I, I remember my mother ringing up Irish Pride giving out because... Uh, if something has more than 1.2% alcohol in it, it has to be mentioned on the packet, but it obviously didn't. But when you have a full bag, a full packet of it, there's probably a couple of you know percentage of alcohol in you or whatever. But you're listening, so you weren't going to take ownership of being stupid enough to eat that much free ash bread. Now it's tasty, but it's a bit sweet, isn't it? I was injured once, and uh, I just once. Yeah, well, I, thought okay. you injured for Sorry, yeah, yeah. Years. I was injured regularly, but um, I just said to myself, Jesus, what am I going to do here to make sure I kind of don't uh, or try and save time on coming back or whatever? So I just cut out the brioche completely and uh, I missed it. I probably withdraw symptoms for a couple of weeks, but it probably definitely helped me after. And I have never gone back to it since, thank God. Uh, John O'Sullivan was first in with the answer that the rock, Dermot O'Sullivan, he's over the down, or sorry, coaching the down senior hurlers. Jay Quan was in just after, as was ML89, and Pa Moore, I presume Pa Morrissey. Uh, John Sullivan was first man in as well with the Ross Common senior hurling team. That's Richie Power with an involvement as well. Uh, no one came in with Fermanagh, though, did they? No, we're still waiting for an answer on that. P. I think that kind also. of slipped under the radar a small bit, and it was very, very left field. I'd say a lot of people saw it and thought it was Waterford Whispers or something, I'd say. Yeah, and I was actually chatting to him uh, about this at the coaching clinic in UCD in December. So it's Stephen Poacher who's involved with Fermanagh Hurlers, and he says they're brilliant at, at taking on board everything that he's saying. Because, you know, obviously he's a guy with no hurling background, but he's coming in and, like, for sure there's a huge amount of crossover between hurling and football, and a lot can be brought over across... So I'd say an awful lot of what he's doing and has been doing with football teams would certainly make sense for a hurling team. But he says they're they're very much on board and uh, taking on board what he has to say. Had to go on his 12-step program to get off the brioche, Bernie. <laughs> Not quite. Had the sweats for a couple of days, all right. Not to mention they're from the other end as well. Uh, the Munster <laughs> Hurling League. So will you read out the result there and then sure, I suppose you'll start grilling me about Tipperary. The Munster Hurling League, yeah, we're going to start off, obviously it was... Uh, uh, the Tuesday night kickoff it was the first game of the, the new inter county season. Finished Waterford 21 points, Tipperary 115. Uh, it was originally down for Friar Field, uh, Dungarvan, but was moved to, to Mallow. I think it was a waterlogged pitch. Uh, it was obviously David Fitzgerald's first uh, game and his second coming as Waterford, and Neem Cattle's first game uh, as Tipperary senior boss. Uh, Davy got had the upper hand the other night, uh, as I said, by three points. There's obviously plenty of mitigating circumstances too because. Cottle Barrett was sent off and Tip played the last the goods of about 12 minutes in normal time anyway, but only 14 men. Uh, the guys that impressed probably for Waterford, Ruben Halloran was good on the freeze. Uh, their running game was quite strong. Even just saw that point that Park Fitzgerald got, who we'll probably talk about in a minute. Uh, it was just a lovely move. Quick hand pass, quick stick pass. Lovely point, lovely point uh, on the front foot. I think he was marking Michael Breen at the time. Callum Lines was hold, or Calum Lines was holding at six. Paddy Levy had a very good impact midfield, just doing the really simple things right as he does. Uh, Park Fitzgerald came off the bench and hit two points. He won uh, a county under 20 B title the day before, so it was a busy 24 hours for him. And that was uh, Kilrosanti's first ever. Kilrosanti, Kilrosanti, I'm going to call him. Their first ever under 20 slash under 20 success. Uh, he scored 13 points, five from play uh, that night. And uh, you definitely say with. with uh, Austin Gleeson coming on and Stephen Bennett, Bennett coming on, that Walford probably had a lot more experience on the bench and used an awful lot uh, more. What did you take from the game, Shane, from a, from a tip point of view? And anyone impressed? It's very, listen, it's very difficult to make too many judgments at this time of the year, but was there anyone that stood their head up a bit for you? Well, you just read out every last one of my notes. So you've kind of... That was uh, the Walford notes I read out. Yeah, and I wrote them as well. Um, well, look, it was level when Carl Barrett got sent off. Tipperary had started very unimpressively. They were behind by like 8-1 and then maybe 9-2 in the first half. The wind was unbelievably strong. And a lot of Tipperary chances, at the very least, the first five chances went wide. Some of them dropped short. Some of them just... Uh, like there was even freeze that Jason Ford hit in the first half that dropped short or just went tailed off wide. So that was a big factor in the first half. And I think, like anyone who was watching it, they would tell you quite obviously that the wind wasn't as strong in the second half. But Watford were brilliant at carrying it through the lines in that wind in the second half. So you have to give them a huge amount of credit that they 
that they were able to execute the game plan for the conditions, whereas Tipperary weren't quite as good. But some positives. Early on in the game, I thought Tipperary delivered nice ball to the inside line that we rarely saw in the last year and the last couple of years at times as well, which I found very, very frustrating, as I've kind of mentioned so many times. So <clears throat> there was another couple of things like I thought substitutes Johnny Ryan uh, from Clannock Kenny and Keno Dwyer from uh, Aravel Rovers. Sorry, the other way around. Keno Dwyer is, uh, is Clannock Kenny, Johnny Ryan's Ar Aravel Rovers. thought they did quite well when they came on. Um, Keno Dwyer got a couple of points. And like you go down to 14 men against a team that knows how to use the ball in those conditions, it's no surprising that you lose the remaining, I suppose, maybe 15 minutes or so with injury time. It's no surprise that you lose them by three points. And if that's how you end up losing the game in total by three points, you know, it's not the, the biggest end in the world. Or the, it's not the end of the world. Now, there are definitely positives for Watford that are negatives for Tipperary. So I think 11 or 12 players scored for Watford. Just four mm. players scored for Tipperary. So Jason scored, for, uh, Ford scored 111. Keno Dwyer, he scored a couple, as I said, already coming off the bench. Alan Tynan and Connor Bow got one each. So there's very few players there that really stood up and took over the game in terms of like scoring and whatever. So that would be a bit of a worry and a bit of a concern. But I think Tipperary are obviously trying to change how they're playing. They're putting Michael Breen in full back. He did okay. I mean, to be fair to... DJ four and he won a couple of balls early on in the game out in front, but there were nice balls going in at the same time, so you couldn't blame him too much. And even that Park Fitzgerald point, it was a tough ball going in for a full back to deal with. So I, I don't really blame him. Dan McCormick played wing back. I'm not sure if he'll stay there or if he'd be moved around. Park Campion was tried at six, Shane Neville beside him as well. So there was a lot of players who were getting a chance, Joe Fogarty, Alan Tynan, but players that did stand out doing positive things. Talk Connor Bow, he kind of stood up, did some very good stuff as well. Paddy Cadell had a good first half. As I said, Breen, uh, up until the red card, Cahill Barrett did quite well. But there's still some of the things that annoy me. You know these shots from 100 yards? Like, Rhys Shelley had two frees in the second half from 100 yards. Four put, up, uh, put over a few beauties from the sideline and distance, but there was too many other ones that went wide. So some of the same old failings. Definitely a lot of shortcomings with Tip at the moment. But I'm not going to judge it too hard because this is a first competitive outing and there's an awful lot to fix for Liam Cahill. Yeah, the only thing I'd say is uh, Tipper obviously one of the few teams that got to play a challenge game before Christmas. So you imagine they would have been ahead of <laughs> everyone <laughs> playing challenge game. Well, they're all playing challenge game. It's funny because um, uh, Liam Kearns, who is the awfully senior football manager, would have been like a load of, load of counties played him, but he would have been indirectly or directly punished as a result of awfully hurlers being caught out for that. So awfully footballers that get to play any challenge games before Christmas. And just on that as well, uh, Johnny Maloney, who was the captain last year, has opted out. And Liam Curran said that Niall McNamee is 95% certain that he won't be back. So, uh, And Jordan Hayes is going on a tour of duty. And Owen Rigney has opted out. He was injured all last year. And Niall Darby's out at Crucian. So there's going to be a fair amount of turnover there. Um, but someone asked a question there, and I just put up, Shane. Um, Jay Kwan, is Carl Barrett a liability from a discipline point of view? Now, I don't think so. Uh, and I think something like that is happens very easily at this time of the of the year. I think someone like him, and we have our own, we have one a lad very like him in our own club, Ushie Murphy, who's in with Offaly at the moment, and will be playing against Kilkenny on Sunday, I'd imagine. Who's takes a couple of games when you're playing that type of a role, that really aggressive role, uh, where you're marking one of the opposition's best forwards. It can sometimes take you a couple of games to get into it. Now I know he was Barrett was actually man of the match, I think, against Offaly before Christmas, but in these competitive games, when you're really teetering on that line, uh, you can end up giving away a couple of frees maybe that you wouldn't do at later on in the year. I don't think he's a liability at all, personally. No, I give me 15 Cahill Barrett's, really. I mean, obviously not. You need a balance of different types of players. But, like, how many red cards has he gotten over the course of his career? Should this have even been a red card? I mean, there was a bit of a schmozzle, and he was certainly getting stuck into somebody. But I'm not sure if he had anything beyond the yellow card, which he got anyway. And then I thought the... The second yellow card was unbelievably harsh. Yeah, he put the, there was a player solo and through and kind of cutting across him. He put the hurley in over the shoulder, but it's not like he cleaned him out and clotheslined him. So I thought it was unbelievably harsh. Uh, but if somebody's got a clip that shows that he kind of sinned more than a yellow card for the first one, then fair enough. But that was just my take on it. Uh, would you be happy with the progress of Tip Shane asked Richard Horgan? I mean, obviously, I wasn't blown away by that performance the other night, but there were a couple of little things that I liked. And when the full team is out and you get a few more league games under the belt, that's when I'll start. I mean, can I really judge much based on a game on the what it, whatever it was, the 3rd of January? 
Uh, Richard Hogan with a funny one. Pity wasn't a, bil- a liability in 2019, obviously talking about Cahill Barrett. Um, I agree with this as well, Shane, because I remember chatting uh, I remember chatting Jackie Turner around the time, doing some media thing, and he basically said, remember when Barrett was dropped in 17, he said, Tip will not win in All-Ireland without him. And it's funny, you can think cornerback shouldn't have that big of an effect. Like, Tip had loads of different lads playing cornerback that year. They were beating, what, a pint? by Galway in an All-Ireland semi-final who go on and win the All-Ireland, they would have had a serious chance probably of uh, of doing back-to-back if he was still involved. And I think this is an interesting comment as well, P174. If Cal wants Tip to play his hard-running, huge work rate game, then the Tip team of recent years will have a lot of changes, maybe up to seven, eight new players. There's a balance, and we talked about this last year. Like, if Noel McGrath is playing centre-forward, which he probably will be, you probably, like, I tell you, I'll put it to you this way. Noel McGrath, Jason Ford, John McGrath and Seamus Callanan will not start in the one forward line. And you can maybe only have two potentially starting because I'm not saying any of them are slow per se or anything like that, but your two wing forwards are going to have to be absolute demons to work. Uh, you're going to need two different types of corner forwards as well if Callanan's playing inside, if you get me. You might need one with, you know, one that's going to uh, roam out and do an awful lot of work and set up a lot of scores and another one who's going to be you know a killer with pace inside or whatever but they won't uh, I don't I can't see them all playing he'll marry that speed and work rate with the, the class that is there and the experience that's there yeah I, I couldn't see all of them starting I couldn't really I find it hard to imagine that both Ford and Noel McGrath would start I could see one of those starting and obviously Noel McGrath is the captain so he'll definitely start uh, I could see Callan starting inside with either Kyo or Bo, I could see Bo being a definite starter this year. So will uh, Kyo, one of them wing forward, maybe one of them inside. But I actually liked the look of Bo inside. Now, to be fair to Watford, they like and they, they probably have a, a lot of work done, as Tipperary probably do, but they're obviously coming off a little bit of a higher base. Obviously, they imploded in the championship last year. But even in that Limerick game, they showed, sign, showed some good signs, beat Tipperary, won the league. But they're coming off a little bit of a higher base. But what they're doing with a lot of younger players... You know, the likes of bringing in Paddy Levy and he's hitting the ground running Park Fitzgerald, knowing that, you know, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald has, has to come in as well. Uh, Ruben Halloran really assured on the freeze, all the Bally Gunner lads to come back. I'd say they're feeling pretty good about what they have in there in Watford at the moment. Just watching how they move the ball through the lines and they, they just look that so comfortable and getting Caleb Lyons back into the half back line as well, I think is important because he's at his best there. Oh, I think he's, I think he's a brilliant half back. I think putting him out midfield is fine in theory but I think you're taking away um, a lot of his weapons and whether it be it his athleticism be it attacking from deep um, just one point on tip um, I was half surprised that Jason Ford was playing the other night because it's such an early season game and then I'm kind of thinking and what we said there I wonder if Jason Ford is the type of player that Cahill has laid the gauntlet down to pretty quickly and that he wants him to hit the ground running, and that he almost has a point to prove from the start. That's just something I'm thinking myself because of what you said. Like I, I find it hard to believe that Noel McGrath and Jason Ford would start in the one forward line. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Cal has laid the gauntlet down to Ford. Um, he obviously has a you know a great acquaintance with all those underage players. Maybe guys that up until last year hadn't played too much. Maybe, I'm not saying Liam Cal's loyalties lie more to them, but I'd say a, the likes of Jason Ford might have to prove himself again, I think, to Liam Cal. And, I'm, and listen, I'm sure he will. Yeah, and to be fair, like it's not as if Cal has only got young players in there. He's kept on Cal and he's kept on Bonner Maher, and obviously Noel McGrath has been made captain. Adrian McGrath says Tip's top priority has to be some athletes around the middle. Didn't look like any of that uh, was looked at. Ori Barrett, he was really active in the row for a mature player. Uh, more comments are flying in here. Uh, I know we're going to say these pre-league uh, competitions are irrelevant, but last year proved it when Kerry won the McGrath Cup and Limerick won the Munster Hurling League. <laughs> <laughs> All four will start in the end, Michael, because Cahill will have to taper his selections to what's available. The young players have not been developed and won't. Uh, we have an all I, don't see, a- I do not see all four of them starting, um, and I'd be surprised if three of them played from the start, genuinely, because... I don't think Liam Cattle is looking at it from... like I, I, That's not to say he doesn't want to do his best in 2023. Of course he does. But I think if he realises that for 24 and 25, he needs to blood these guys a bit more, I think he'll do it straight away. I don't think it'll be any... Especially with how short the inter-county season is now. He will, I think he will think of the long game. He'll think of the long game 
and but still try and get results in the short term. That's my opinion on it anyway. Like if you're saying that you know Tip lack some athleticism and mobility and speed, like I playing the four of them, I don't think solves that anyway. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah, it, it would probably scream of short termism. Um, Sean O'Sullivan probably talking about Watford here. We have an All Ireland in us on paper in January. There's a long way to go to make it a reality. Uh, P well seventy four. The players that he has in Watford are a perfect fit for Davies' hurling game plans. Much more suitable than what Wexford have, and even Clare in twenty thirteen. And just what Liam Cahill said after the match the other night, just uh, in terms of his hopes for the year, I guess. Just to get back competitive again and make sure that we're in a good condition come championship and uh, be one of that three in Munster to kick into the latter stages, that's our initial goal, but we have a lot to work on. Uh, there is no uh, next year in tip, just ask Colin Bonner. James Daly says Munster will be dog eat dog this year and Lex Leinster will be very interesting. Hard to know what two counties will make it out of Munster. Three, I suppose. Limerick, well, Limerick obviously is, is being assumed here. <laughs> Limerick first round at Walsh Park versus Watford will be some battle. Uh, we have our three wishes. Actually, sorry, we'll just talk as well as well about the Connacht Hurling League, some of the fixtures. Actually, Davy Fitz, actually, to be fair, he's asked uh, Stephen O'Keefe back in. Very interesting to see if that happens. There's been no suggestion based on how O'Keefe has answered the questions in the last year or so, you know, post-match that he would go back in. So I'm going to assume he won't. I disagree um, because I was because I was there when it was asked after the beat killer on McDonald's. And you know when you just get, you know when you just, an instinct or an eye for something, he, he wasn't like blowing the question away like he had before where, you know, it was not even on the table anymore. I very much felt it was on the table, but it was just that he was kicking it back until Bally Gunner's season was over. That's obviously over now. Um, I, I, just anecdotally, I, I have heard that they obviously finished in 2020 on, I think, the 13th of December, am I right in saying? Um, yeah. And he announced probably two weeks later, I'd say, yeah, no, it was uh, it was during the Leopardstown races, I think the 28th of December, that he wasn't coming back with Walford for 2021. And from what I hear is a lot of that was that Watford were going to go back training straight away in 2021. And as an older player, that he wanted a bit more of a, that he wanted a bit more of Rick. This is just anecdotally what I'm hearing. Um, whereas I think Davy will give him a break because he knows what like as we said, Stephen O'Keefe is top three, one of the top three keepers in the country. I think hands down. I I wouldn't. I don't think any. I don't think anybody else comes into that tree with him and Nicky Quaid. There are others on the periphery, and I think Davy will give him whatever time he needs. And if that's Stephen O'Keefe returns to the squad, you know, in a month's time on the eve of the league, I think he'll go at that because he know like Davy's a keeper as well, and he knows what he offers to the squad, and um, I think he'll do. I think I think Stephen O'Keefe will be back in. Mm, just a reminder, we're brought to you by rstore.ie, a load of stuff, official merchandise of our game on the site, rstore.ie, plenty of stuff there, uh, so have a little look if you want to get any of those great uh, little items that we have there, and there'll be plenty more coming in the weeks and months to follow. So, Michael, um, let's, uh, let's, let's continue on here and talk about uh, the Connacht Hurling League. So this is a developmental Galway panel that beat New York 30 points to 17. Eamon O'Shea and Tommy Dunn are over the, the Galway team, which is kind of interesting to see two Tipperary men involved. Now, obviously, Eamon O'Shea has, has a son on the Galway panel at the moment, and he's based up in Galway. But picking from junior clubs only, I think uh, it's, it's probably a good step because a lot of these players wouldn't have an opportunity to get the S&C done or train at that higher intensity level or, or whatever it might be. So it's a good way to get these players on the radar. Yeah, and I wonder, will this continue on outside of this competition? Is it going to act as a developmental squad uh, for some of them? It's obviously junior clubs. I don't know numbers wise. I think there was a there's a there was a three time All Ireland minor winner in there playing uh, for Galway last night. Um, but picking from junior clubs, obviously, it's not. It doesn't look like directly a developmental squad. Sean McDonough, I think, I think he has three minor All Irelands, and he played very well for Galway last night. Um, the, my, one of my big takeaways from this dome is is how much of a disaster it is to defend in the dome. Look at the scores that have been put up. Ross Common hit something ludicrous. 633. Against, yeah, like, oh my God. The football scores, like, it's routine for, you know, a football team to kick 20 points there. Uh, Galway obviously hit 30 points in Hurling. It just, it is a forward's dream. It's If you've got a good first touch, like, there's literally no margin for error for a defender defending in the dome or anything like that. There really isn't. Um, I actually, uh, a couple of pictures sent on to me from one of the games there last night. Uh, it's interesting shooting into the goals, I thought. There's a grey area at the back of the goals, 
And the goals are white, but I just thought maybe I'm making excuses for a cornerback taking a pot shot. It does kind of blend in with the background, but that that theory is absolutely ripped up when you see the scores that have been put up up there. So maybe that's just me making excuses. Yeah, Darla Hans says, when is the forfeit for the quiz? So we were talking about this at the top of the show. Sam and Bernie had a quiz against each other just at the, the last show of 2022. Which I won, still, by the way. Well, which he won on the last question. The forfeits, and forfeits were, if he lost, he had to get a, a sweet little uh, skin fade in his hair like this here. And uh, if I lost, I had to shave off the beard. So I'm going to be doing that for Monday. Obviously not looking forward to that. Going to be very baby-faced. Denny Max says, all Ireland goes through Watford again this year. Jay Kwan says that Owen Murphy mentioned recently uh, that yeah. Stephen O'Keefe was the GOAT goalkeeper. And Go. Sean O'Sullivan adds that in terms of All-Stars, Saki's lack of awards is criminal. Go back to the previous comment there. Uh, the, the very first one you pulled up there, because that was totally said tongue-in-cheek. That's I know it was. Yeah, like, that's brilliant. It's going through what uh, Derek McGrath said after the, after the league final this year. Um, but just from a Stephen O'Keefe point of view, he still has so much to offer as a keeper. He's another three or four years to play at county level if he wants to. Um, and if he does come back, you'd imagine he would play till the end of Davies' term, which I think is three years as well. And just something on Tip and Waterford, which I thought was, it's, it's a very, very minor thing. But obviously, Davy was over Wexford when Tipperary went down to 14 men in the All-Ireland semi-final against Tipperary and didn't make use of it. But maybe he's learned a small bit as Waterford manager. Tip went down to 14 men the other day and they did make use of it. That's a, a brief little aside. But uh, I would definitely say that on to, go, to piggyback on what one of our commenters said, Davy's style does suit what the Waterford style is and the, what the type of player they have available to them. Really, really mobile players and similar to Liam Cattle's style where massive, massive energy and massive work rate is required. Yeah, remain like very much remains to be seen. It's such early days, and you know we can't just say that based on one monster hurling league game. But we'll obviously be talking about more as the weeks and, and months go by. John Collins, tip won't act as rapidly again. Management, re management change. Cahill won't want it, but he has a free season and time to build more impatience in Cork. I suspect we don't do patience in Tipperary. C can I just say something as well? Liam Cahill, uh, when he was brought in in Waterford, Waterford were at a fair low now. You'd have to say, having been you know, hockeyed in the previous year's Munster round robin. And like very little was probably expected. And did a load of lads missing for that Munster court, Munster semi-final against Cork. And like he just blew it out of water and they went all the way to the All-Ireland final and were the only team to ask questions of Limerick that year. So like he, he's definitely not beyond turning a ship around very, very quickly. So I'd have, I'd have a fair bit of faith in that now. Yeah, Adrian uh, McGrath says, John Collins, if Tip lost four out of four, there might be a lot of lads who didn't like what happened to Bonner waiting to stick the knife in. Uh, should the GA not run an intercounty blitz in the Dome over a weekend in January just to kick the season off? Would you be interested in seeing that? Well, there isn't enough really, um, there's not enough room really to have a decent attendance in there. A blitz? I haven't heard that word in a long time. Jesus, go well, back to primary and secondary school. Um, you could have like a festival or something like that. Uh, you could play a seven aside maybe across the pitches, or I don't know, just yeah, something like that would be great. But in fairness to them, at least, uh, when was it? It was earlier this week, was it Monday, uh, Monday or Tuesday? Because the Connacht Championship might have or Connacht Hurling League might have actually kicked off the inter county season. I said Waterford and uh, Waterford and Tip did the other day, but they had three matches in the dome, so these are going for three games and you're not going for one. But wouldn't it be unreal to get you know the big Munster counties, Kilkenny, Galway, big Leinster counties there? For a day or something like that, it'd be class. It'd be dead. And yeah, obviously, would. there's no worry about pitches or games being called off or anything like that either. Obviously, it, you are traveling to Beacon, which is in the back, the back of it's the bacon, back of, for God's back sake. B E K A N. Bacon it's is bacon. B, -A B A C O N. But it that's how it's pronounced. It's bacon. They'll bring them up to Beacon. <laughs> Beacon is B E A C O N. I'm actually hey, I'm actually trolling you. I'm doing my best to troll your pronunciation for the last <laughs> year. <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. Okay, your three GEA wishes for the year. So you give your first one, then I give my first one. And viewers out there, give us your um, your three wishes for the year, or even just one. Cork people, close your eyes. My first wish for the year is that Cork find a spine in their defence. Um, and that's wow. a, a really solid three and six and a real teak tough defence where you know if you run down the heart of the Cork defence, you're going to be left on your arse. Um, and I'd love to see that. Um, there's a couple of games in recent memories. 
the Limerick game in 2019, the round robin game, they were re- you know really physical that day, real physical stuff. There was no getting through for Limerick. I'm really interested to see who Pat Ryan goes with at three and six, and I if they solidify that defence. And listen, that probably starts, that does start from the full forward line back. If that ment- there's a mentality shift, there's no doubt that they definitely have the players. But I'm just really, really interested to see what the, you know, that centre of the, the Cork defence is looking like for next year. Okay, this well, year. my first wish for the year is to have some rules updated. Number one, delete the advance mark. Uh, part of that also is that black card tackles are all, also lead to the awarding of a penalty. Because nobody does a black card tackle unless they want to stop a scoring opportunity. So it should be a penalty. Nobody will do any cynical fouling anymore. And then also to have that brought into club as well. Because we're seeing rugby tackles in club all the time. And I mean that application of the rule that a black ta- card tackle is not only a card, but it is also a penalty. Now, I'd actually be happy to not have like a 10-minute sin bin or anything like that. i just say a black card tackle means... You're on a card, and a, and a second card of any variety will lead to a red card, but it's a penalty. Because the main reason to, for fouling like that is to stop scoring. So let's punish you the, the very last way you want to get punished. Punish them on the scoreboard, 100%. Yeah. Um, if you miss the penalty, you miss the penalty. Tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, are we talking, you've said this before, are we talking anywhere on the field? Yeah, because it won't happen. Like It's, it's like one in a million that it would happen somewhere else. But like, why not have it? Because we've seen it in a couple of games in recent times that the cynical fouls are happening out beyond the D in 21. Teams are intentionally fouling it that little bit earlier. And it's going to, like, think of the 2017, was it 2017 All-Ireland where Dublin were basically rugby tackling the Mayo mm-hmm. players? 13. Were, yeah. Huh? 2013, it was particularly no, 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 no. There was a far more recent one than that where okay. a few of the Dublin lads got black carded towards the end. They were trying to take a kick out and they were rugby tackling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Conor Costello kicked the tee away or kicked the ball away. Something like that. So um, I'm saying that if that had to lead to a penalty at the time or somebody, I think someone else rugby tackled the player to the ground. If that had to happen, that, that wouldn't have happened if you were to, but it was such a rare occasion. It's just for those rare occasions. So I think a rule should be all encompassing and not just in one little tiny area. Well, they'll become a lot rarer. Um, and, and listen, it's a bit of short-term pain. Uh, it's a bit of short-term pain. It will happen to a couple of people and people really realise we can't enforce it. I, I tell you what, though, I, do, I just don't see it happening because they're not even enforcing the black card at inter-county level in Hurling at the moment. Was but I think they'd, enforce, they'd be far more inclined to enforce a penalty than they would be to a black card because the problem with the black card is you're singling someone out and they're out of game for the rest of it. And it fundamentally changes the game. Whereas, like, a penalty, yeah, you can change the course of a match. But how likely are players to just haul someone onto the ground intentionally if they know that this will lead to a penalty? They just won't. Get the Saint on a a steering committee. That's why I say. So, like, we'll come to your second one in in a moment. Uh, Richard Hogan says Derek uh, Ling to hit the ground running, obviously, with Kilkenny. Garoto will rock on, wants Clare to win Munster. Uh, Ref forget about black cars the third week of the league last year needs to be enforced properly. Cork County Championship doesn't produce battle-hardened players for inter- intercontinental fare. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> We're a while away from seriously contesting, in my opinion. To have Hawkeye at all games and grounds, I think it's probably too expensive. No wonder Shane wants that. Presumably we're talking about the penalties. It's the only way a tip can win a hurling match. <laughs> Jay Quan says, no Hawkeye issues, no cynical fouls, some new underage hurlers to have a great year, i.e. Paddy Fitzgerald, Cahill O'Neill, etc. What's your second wish for the year? Yeah, I kind of looked at my wish list a little bit different than you. I looked at things I actually want to see happening, whereas I think you maybe looked at it in a different way, as in rule changes or whatever. I've actually forgotten my second one. I have it, ri- I have it written down here, though. Um, oh, yeah. My second one is that awfully, the awfully kind of rebuild continues uh, and that that, that uh, under-17 team from last year continues to develop at under-20 under the same management. And a load of them are playing combined schools, which has never happened before. So awfully combined schools are in... Uh, a Leinster A College semi final. Uh, I'm not sure who they're playing, but it's at the, at the end of the month. And like realistically, we should we should probably be winning that, even though I believe it's the best Kieran's team in a generation. But just that that development uh, continues. I, and I don't. I'm not even talking about awfully winning the Joe McDonough because I don't think that's nearly a necessary step at this stage in time. Just that that development continues and that that they're very very competitive. Uh, and a lot of those faces the. Dan Ravenhills, the Adam Screenies, the James Mahans and the like are continue to, to come through the ranks. And I suppose as well, 
that the same fate of a lot of the awfully under 20 all Ireland winning footballers who a load of them have picked up like really serious injuries uh, Morgan Tynan Cormac Egan John Furlong and a few more that I suppose that same fate uh, doesn't kind of hit them as well that's that's definitely something I, I really want to see this year yeah so my second one is to have rival finals this year so I want to see Kerry against Dublin in an all Ireland football final I want to see McCaffrey Paul Mannion um Conor Callaghan obviously back I want to see every like Kerry to have their strongest team possible because I think it's going to be a it would be a brilliant final and I think assuming both go the front door the whole way through that they would meet in an all Ireland final can you imagine the skin and hair flying, especially now with Kerry having the confidence of having won in All Ireland and Dublin having gone a couple of seasons looking to get back there, albeit with you know a huge amount of All Stars and footballers a year in their panel? I think that would be an unbelievable one. I also want to see Leash against Offaly in the Joe McDonough final. There'd be skin and hair flying there, and I want to see Shefflin against Ling in the Leinster final. So oh, that's my that's my wish. Very good. I listen. It's the stakes are always raised when it's kind of that. Not even like Dublin Kerry isn't local, but it's it's just ah oh, you just look forward to a Dublin Kerry game so much. Like I'm yeah, I'm the same as you. I'm looking forward to them playing. Like the second it was announced that Mannion and McCaffrey were coming back, the second it was announced that Pat Gilroy is going to be in the fall or whatever. Um, it is something that it's just a tantalising prospect. Look at the best games of the last ten years: Dublin Kerry thirteen. Dublin Kerry, uh, was it 16 or 17 in that semi final? Dublin Kerry, 19, both games. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Dublin Kerry last year. Like, it's just something different. Uh, I'll put it this way it's a rare occasion where I enjoy a football match as much as any hurling match. I'll put it that way. And I mean that in the best way possible. Uh, P well 74 says let the referee ref games like they did from the provincial finals on last year Limerick played Munster final semi-final in All-Ireland last year with no cards of any sort and were supposed to be filthy he says SSRI says a heavier slitter to come back number one two Westmead to take a major scalp in the championship and survive in the league and number three Galway to win the All-Ireland Jack Nulty says Longford have a good run in Division 3 with all their players in now and have a tilt at the Talchon Cup and they had a great result uh, wasn't it last night against Leash as well yeah, up a big yeah. score uh, Grodoga Gracon says number two Dublin's best hurlers play inter county hurling instead of football. And add seeing Luke Swan on the Dublin football squad last night was another eye roll moment. I think he was uh, he was in the 26, but he certainly wasn't named to start. Yeah, um, there's a couple other comments there. ML89 just says, I don't think Kieran's team are that good, Michael. Very average for Kieran's could still win all Ireland. I'm hearing reports anyway from uh rival colleges that it's the one of the best Kieran's teams in an awful long time so that's what I, that's what i'm basing that on uh we're also going to build them up if they play awfully schools as well so um, that's I, part I, of know, are, are niall shorthall and killian corcoran who are you know still with bally gunner and facing or bally hale and facing into an all-ireland are they both starting yeah i think so yeah they're both still in both still in school anyway yeah definitely yeah, yeah. Adrian McGrath says, number one, Mark Rogers, Shane Meehan and Aidan McCarthy to start for Clare. Number two, Clare to win an under-20 match. Three senior camogie matches as curtain raisers for senior hurling as much as possible. So keep yours coming in. What's your third one? Uh, I've gone off in a different way completely here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, you're going, you're, I, I'm going to get absolutely trolled over this. But my, uh, my, other, my other wish for 2023 is that TJ Reid makes it up the Hogan stand steps and can Kenny win the All-Ireland and he retires on the spot. So you want him to go full Leo Messi? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I think yeah. he should. I think he should actually, when he's going to retire from Kilkenny, he should actually do like a retirement tour, and it should all build up to potentially an All Ireland final. But I just think for a player of his stature, he's obviously nearing the end. It would be unbelievable if he uh, if he left at the you know the, the highest occasion possible. Messi did something, and then never even taught Messi. Uh, but that's a fairy tale ending that just like that's a 0.01% chance of that actually happening. Um, I just think he's the best, he's the best player, uh, he's the best player of the current generation, and it would be unbelievable to go out that way. That's that's the way that's just that's the way I look at it. And Richard and, Hogan just says, and beating Tip in the final two, Tip won't be near an all Ireland final, so we'll take that part out of it. Okay, well, look, let's imagine Tip did get there. What about Seamus Callan, who's 34 now? Coming back for the season this year, would you not like to see him do it? I'd love to see him come back uh, in style, definitely. I mean, um, the All Ireland. Mm, no, no, th no, thank you. Um, but I would, <laughs> but I would love to see him come back because he's had like last year he didn't get to play any championship at all, and we'll come on to that in a while. Um, I just, 
I don't like to see lads who've had such great careers. It's like TJ last year. It would have been terrible if after the Galway game, you know, if he'd kind of limped out or something like that. He did the exact opposite. But you like these real marquee players to finish in style. Or at least, just say if TJ had retired at the end of the All-Ireland last year, at least, you know, he retired he would have retired after an All-Ireland final having played well and been nominated for her of the year. The last thing you want to do is see someone limp out the door or see them kind of kicked out the door, if you get me as well. Yeah, okay, so uh, Vernie wants Kilkenny to win TJ or no TJ. Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> Black says, number one, Limerick four in a row, senior hurling All-Irelands. Limerick senior footballers to meet an All-Ireland quarterfinal and Tom Morrissey to win her of the year. Porter Porter says, Noel McGrath to get another All-Ireland. Callan wouldn't lace TJ's boots, says Jay Quan, who does forget that uh, James Callan has is it 38 or 39 championship goals, every single one of them from play. The most, that's all you need to know, is the most goals scored of anyone ever in the history of the Ireland Hurling Championship. No, that's not true. Has he not? No, Nicky Record. From play, I should say. Oh, yeah, from play. Well, I presume Nicky uh... Record. Nicky Record scored six goals, I think, in an All Ireland semi final against Antrim once. And I'd say a few of them were 21 yard frees. He was a fair detail for him. He's the greatest. Callan is obviously the greatest goal scorer of our generation, of our, our, of our, our lifetime. That's the, way, that's the way we put it. But uh, Record was unbelievable. Okay, so am I giving my third one now? I think you've given it already. Seamus Callan no, to go out in a blaze of glory. No, but uh, oh wait, Grodo go crack on Tipperary to lose to Kerry again in Ireland. <laughs> uh, still doesn't lace Reed's boots, says uh, Richard Hogan. Uh, Seamus is a legend, probably better goal scorer, but all around player TJ is a bit better. Uh, okay, so my third one is Tipperary to get out of Munster, find a host of players, and bridge some of the physical and tactical gap to Limerick. So if Tipperary get out of Munster, I don't like even if Tip don't get out of Munster, but play very well and get pick up a victory or two. Yeah, but well, getting out of Munster, you know us, we need to get out of Munster. Yeah, I would agree though. I don't necessarily think I don't think it's um I don't think it's necessarily results based. It's perform it's gonna be more performance based. If they, you know, run Limerick to within an inch of their lives, if they're really competitive like Cork blew them away last year, um Claire blew them away as well. So like if those gaps are closed massively and the level of performance is really, really high, all you want from your county, and this is why really bugged me about Offley for probably five or six years, is that you're just maximizing what you have and you're getting to the level that you should be at. That's all. And that's all you think with Tipperary. Okay, maybe Tipperary aren't going to win the All Ireland, but we're a lot better than what we showed last year. And it's just to get up to that level. And to Play to your ability, I would say, really, is, is what it is. And that's um, if that's Fort and Munster with a draw, a win, and a couple of tight losses, then that's fair enough. If that's second in Munster or winning Munster, all the better. Yeah, as my, my asking, is that three wishes in one? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's looking for improvement in tip. That, uh, that's Mike, like, you, still... you know, if you could have one wish, what would you wish for? I'd wish for another 100 wishes. <laughs> 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 Michael, do you still think Clare will get out won't won't get out of Munster as Jay Quan? Yeah, no, I do, yeah. I think it will be uh Limerick one, Waterford two, Cork three. Right, uh, right. Tip four, Clare five. Wow. And a Clare man, Adrian McGrath, says Jay's is saying this is a wish list, <laughs> not a letter to Santa. <laughs> uh we're we're gonna do our wish our sorry, our predictions for the year. Um do you want to start off with yours? Uh we talking hurling. Well, we're talking championship anyway, so whatever way you like to do it, go for it. Okay, I'll fly through Leinster. Uh, I think Galway will, will, will win Leinster, beating Kilkenny in the final. I think they'll top their own Robin as well. Uh, I think Limerick will win Munster, and I think Limerick will probably beat Galway in the All-Ireland final and do the, do the four in a row. Um, just jump back a small bit. Joe McDonough. Ooh, Kerry are going for uh, to try and make it what? Four time unlucky. I don't even know if they I'm not sure if they get to the final, but I, I this is a funny one. I don't leash are dropping back, but I don't think it's a guarantee that they come straight back up. Um that Joe McDonough is so competitive. Very hard. It's so you actually competitive. couldn't call who come in any position. No, and you need to um it's kind of hard to call at the moment because you'd need to see how they've all performed uh in the league. Oh, if push came to shove, I might you know what? I might go with Kerry. I might. I might go with Kerry. If push came to shove. Okay, so I and I'd love in... to see them in Munster, and I, just to, for that to cause the disarray which it will cause. I I think it'd be great to have them in Munster. Assuming they want to be there, it means the both provinces have six teams, and 
obviously Tipperary can prove that they are in fact the fifth best team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, it, this is the first year that Kerry will actually get promoted straight to the Munster Championship, Munster Round Robin, if they do get through. Um, so it'd be unreal if they were able to do it in that first year, even though I would have liked them to cause that relegation promotion playoff. Uh, that was one of the worst rules in the history of the GA up, up until the change of this year. John Collins, this is back to his three wishes for the year. Trial, freeze, slash sidelines to be taken within a minute of being awarded. Two, slitter to be modified so it doesn't travel as far. Three, only hand pass off the boss at the hurley to be trialed. Um, okay, so I Mike... Think the boys, I think the boys have gone... The wish list now, I, I, if we're talking about rule changes and stuff like that, that'd be a bit different. On one like rule change or potential trial I'd love to see is that uh, whoever makes the free must take it wherever it is on the field. Make or take her. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love. To, I'd love to see that. Um, the person who's foul is there at the ball, so it will speed up the game. It will also mean that uh, it should improve skill levels because, like, not been smart. I wouldn't have you near a free, but if you won a free, you're going to have to hit it. So your skills are hopefully going to have to be worked on a bit more. So now, did I'm you not see myself against Nisha doing the the freeze from hundred yards, and I got three oh five? No, I didn't watch that one actually. So, um, so now at training, they're not going to be like saying just be an old pig under a high ball. They're going to be like, okay, saying if you win a free, we might just spend five minutes you hitting frees or something like that. So it would bring your skill oh, level. Well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine they'd have to create the new rule, makers takers, unless someone pretends to be concussed so they don't have to hit a free on the biggest <laughs> stage of them all. I'm going to give my uh, championship winners this season. I'll throw in the football while I'm at it in Leinster. I think the Hurling champions are going to be Galway. Football champions, I think, are going to be Dublin. In Munster, I'll go with Limerick for the Hurling and Kerry for the football. Connacht, I think Galway, they're going to frank the form from this past year, even though I think I think Mayo will probably take a while to find their feet under Kevin McStay because of the player changeover. And they, they'll need Ryan O'Donoghue and Tommy Conroy, etc., back fully fit this year. Uh, but I'll go with Galway. And I think I think our man, like, might win the football in Ulster because we looked at the roots earlier on. We were trying to figure out who'll win this, and it's it's unbelievably difficult. But uh, I thought that as well, Shane. And then I'm thinking, how many Ulster Championship games has Geezer won in his in his reign? It would book a lot of trends. They'd have to yeah, win but, three games consecutively. Four, yeah, no, that's a fair four, point. Actually, yeah, and, and they're drawn in the preliminary round as well. Yeah, but I think four. they'll fancy beating Antrim first off. Uh, then they'll have Cavan. And if, assuming they beat Cavan, which is no foregone conclusion, they'll have the winners of Donegal down, which is tough. And then you get to, and, and you're only at the semi final at that stage. Really tough. But on the other side, I think most people fancy Derry to beat Fermanagh in their quarter final. Throne, Monaghan, God only knows. So then you'll have presumably Derry against Throne or Monaghan. So that's a tough side as well. Uh, very hard to call. I mean, it, it's a bit of a lottery, but I've kind of gone for our man. I could, I'll probably end up with egg in my face there. So those are my predictions for that. Were we going to talk about... No, we've we've other stuff to talk about when we get later on. It's players to watch for this year and comeback players. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. But there's a few more fixtures this weekend that you might touch on. There surely is. Um, are we talking about... Uh, we're talking about hurling or football fixtures. We got into football. Hi. Actually, sorry, one other thing. You know the way you're saying make or take her in, um, in, in terms of freeze? Yeah. What about if you're the person who gives away the penalty, you're the one who has to stand in goals for it? <laughs> That's huh? like a walk, walk the plank effort or something. Yeah. Um, you think twice about rugby tackling and let onto the ground then. The per- how much would the percentage of it being, being scored increase as well? Not being smart, particularly if it's, you know, a cynical fullback or cornerback who's the one that's doing the foul. And like, I wouldn't fancy standing, I wouldn't stand, fancy standing on the line of penalty with five people, let alone myself being the only one. You know what well, I mean? There you go. Yeah. So we've already said that Kerry are going to be playing Cork in the, in the, uh, Monster Hurling League. Tipperary against Clare. Is that Saturday or Sunday? It's in Nina at 1.30. We were there Sunday, a couple of think, years yeah. Yeah, we were there a couple of years ago. Nina, at this time of the year, I mean, it, well, we saw it in a December. I'd imagine the pitch is going to be a little bit slow and bumpy this time of the year. And it's a, it's a great uh, facility and all that, but you just imagine that the pitches aren't going to be great at this time of the year. So it'll be a first outing for Clare. Um, yeah, Tipperary could do with a win there, couldn't they? Ah, uh, they could, yeah. Um, they obviously have that advantage of having a game under the belt. It, de- it definitely does help because... It's just, it's hard to replicate. Could they be so, tired, though, after that game against Watford? Uh, depends. Um, they're pulling, I doubt it, Shane. They're pulling, they're pulling from a decent squad as well, so I'd imagine they'd uh, juggle it a fair bit. But that a game like that, you would be sore, your legs would be sore for three or four days, given just how heavy it was. But the benefits of it, um, 
you will in a week's time or 10 days time you'll probably bear the fruits of it but you'd be expecting a bit of a hop from them in it and then obviously in Leinster there's a couple of really interesting games as well so the Walsh Cup is kicking off on Sunday you have Michal Donoghue's uh, debut as Dublin manager there facing Antrim in Parnell Park uh, Galway against Westmead in Dugan Park in Banner Slow you have Leash against Wexford so that's Willie Maher's debut against Darry Egan again two uh, Tipperary natives going up against each other uh, and the no- more debuts here, you have Kilkenny against Offaly in John Locke Park in Callan on Sunday. So you have Derek Ling. Uh, it would be the first time in what, since early January, probably 1999, that Brian Cody won't be patrolling the sideline. Derek Ling is the new man in there, and he'll be facing up against uh, another. He's not an inter county managerial uh, debutant, uh, Johnny Kelly, because he managed Ross Common, but probably. In the big time, this will be his first go as manager, um, and that's going to be an interesting one there. Obviously, Offaly are a McDonough Cup team, and Kilkenny are obviously coming back from the All-Ireland final last year, but they're down a couple of bodies with the likes of uh, Connor Brown, uh, Richie Lahey, uh, James Maher. James Maher. They've down, they've, you know, their bodies are going to be hard to kind of replace, but I'm sure there'll be lots of new faces on show. When they played, when Kilkenny played in Callan last year against Leash, there was a load of new faces on show. Be interesting to see whether Derek Ling, you know, has a bit of old with the new, maybe. But uh, lots of big debuts over the weekend. Anyone in particular you're you're looking forward to most? Probably Derek Ling, Johnny Kelly, Willie Maher, and, and Michal Dunahoo. I suppose Dunahoo is a really interesting one. Be really be fascinating to see how he goes at Dublin. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. And I want to see what players kind of fill the voids that are going to be left by Chris Crummy. Liam Rush has obviously had his injuries in recent times, and Keno Callahan, who like uh, Crummy, has emigrated. Um, so I am interested to see that. I'm also very interested to see how Galway go this year and who else they add because they showed a lot of really good flashes in the first game against Kilkenny in the championship, the one that they won in Salt Hill, and obviously in the All-Ireland semi-final. But other games, they were fairly ropey, so they need yeah. to add a few players. I want to see how how Leash go under Willie Maher. Obviously, he was my manager in Kula for a couple of years. And then with the, the Derek Ling thing is... It's a bit like we've heard the comparison before about Alex Ferguson and Brian Cody, but and even I suppose if you want to take it a little bit further back as well, Sean, um, uh, in Meath, Sean, what's his name again? Boylan. Huh? huh? Boylan. Sean Boylan. I don't know why I just had a little, uh, it just escaped me there for a moment. But will it be a little bit like that? Because, you know, Ferguson left, David Moyes came in, that was a disaster. And obviously the few managers after that, Louis Van Hal, Jose Mourinho and, all, and so on and so forth, didn't go well. Uh, you could say that they're still trying to recover from Sean Boyle and leaving in Meath. Is it going to be a tough one for Derek Ling taking over from Brian Cody? Because, you know, nobody questioned Cody there for the last, up until the last couple of years, because of uh, all the titles he had won. Whereas Ling is coming in, yes, under 20 All-Ireland success. But do the knives come out fairly quickly from the locals or do they give him a huge amount of uh, time before any pressure comes on? And will he hit the ground running? Yeah, well, a lot of, you know, anecdotally anyway, a lot of locals would have been looking for change or would have been looking for a diff- different styles of play to be implemented or something like that. And that, you know, that was probably only going to happen to some extent with a new man coming in. So I'd say he probably, even though standards are very high, he probably does have a bit of time. I think crucially, and it wasn't the case with David Moyes and hasn't been the case with a lot of the kind of successors. Ling obviously was in there for a long time as a player knows what it's like, was in there for a long time as a coach, knows what it's like, and also knows a, a heap of these players from being with the 20s as well. Or maybe not a heap of them, but a good chunk of them. And knows the character of a lot of the lads from when he was a player and a coach as well. So I think he has a bit of a leg up starting. I think it's a lot left, uh, a lot less kind of left field, or there's a lot less of the unknown to it, I would say. Yeah, so PL74 makes a great point. Tyrone did all right after Mickey Hart left. Now, the one thing there is that you ha- obviously had a two-man management team come in, so it sort of spread the load or, I suppose, the responsibility or the spotlight was shared out between two men, whereas here it's just going to be all on Ling. And I wonder if he drops a few players or, or, or whatever, how quickly will the headline Ling the Merciless come out? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I hadn't even, <laughs> hadn't, even, hadn't even thought of that, to be honest with you. You know it's going to happen, and you know one of the tabloids is going to put the, the long little stringy um, sort of moustache thing on him as well. <laughs> I, said it to, I said it to John McIntyre when he was on before, but when he came in, in his second term at Offaly, and maybe his second year, he cut a load of elder statesmen, and the headline in the local was Mac the Knife. It's just brilliant. Like, you know, you, you have to appreciate uh, people who are able to come up with this type of thing. But um, the only thing I'd say about, would say like, by all accounts, it looks like Richie Hogan is staying on. Connor Fogarty is staying on. 
Walter is staying on, uh, Killian Buckley, TJ. Some of them have been on the periphery, you know, for large chunks in recent years. Maybe there was injuries kind of combined in that as well. But it's not a big departure. Like, I tell you what would be a big departure. If he doesn't start TJ in a big championship match or something like that, that's a big that's a big kind of thing. But a lot of those, not saying they were, they, they've been phased out, but they definitely haven't played uh, as much in the last couple of years as they would have, would say, in the Pompadour career. So... I don't. I don't know. I'd say only only dropping TJ, only dropping Owen Murphy or someone like that would be seen as you know really big statement and your Ling the Merciless uh, headline. Yeah, there's only a couple of players that I'd imagine have played alongside Ling. Uh, I think he retired at the end of the 2010 season, so you're looking at the likes of you Richie ran Holmes. him out, huh? You ran <laughs> yeah. him out. <laughs> but you're looking at uh, TJ Reid, Richie Holden. Is there anybody else that goes back that far? Probably Owen not. Owen Murphy wasn't even involved at that no. time, I don't think. Um, no, he only started probably around 2014, wasn't it? Didn't he come in for David Herity that time? Yeah, it might have been on the panel a couple of years before yeah. that. But uh, no, there probably there wouldn't be that many. Um, from the coaching point of view, he obviously would have seen a load of them through coaching, be it seniors or when he was manager with the 20s. Yeah, so the Kyo Cup is also on in Leinster. Mead against Down, Carlo Wicklow, Kildare against Carlo, and Wicklow against Mead. Now, we're going to be talking a bit about comeback players of the year, and we're also going to be talking about ones to watch, both football and hurling, in a while. But at the Munster McGrath Cup, Cork beat Kerry 5 11 to 14 points. Would you be reading much into that? Not really, uh, Shane. I just thought it was interesting that, you know, they conceded more goals in one game last night than they did across all competitions in 2023 um i don't know i it's probably not a bad thing in a way they're not long back from their holiday um they're probably a decent bit behind maybe other teams as well uh i wouldn't be reading too much into it now being honest with you uh i remember being down at uh i remember being down at kerry and tip down in mine temple Tui last year when they were playing with a real skeleton squad but it was a pretty strong squad they only um they only had they only had eighteen or nineteen. That was the time Jack Savage and Tony Brosnan came up from playing a colleges game that day. But they were all well known names. Whereas you go through the team sheet last night, and I'll actually just fly through it while we're talking. So you're looking at Jay Murphy was obviously playing goals. Jason Foley, Tyg Morley was playing. Uh, Dermot O'Connor, Ad, uh, Adrian Spillane, Tony Brosnan, uh, and Killian Spillane. But outside of that, like Mike Breen came on, Stefan Ockenbar came on. Uh, Barry came on, Michal Burns came on, Dara Mining, but a lot of them, uh, a lot of the big names probably didn't start. They probably finished with a better team than they started with, so I wouldn't be reading too much into it. From a Cork point of view, decent start, though, you'd have to say. Um, mm -hmm. you can, yeah. you, it's always good. Anytime you can beat Kerry in any sort of game is good, and uh, they've lost a player or two to the hurlers, so it's important probably to hit the, hit the ground running. Yeah, and it probably could have been seven or eight goals, really. I think even Jack O'Connor admitted that afterwards. Uh, Adam Moynan, who's a journalist down in um, Kerry, he was saying not too many positives for Kerry, but Barry Mahoney and Dara Roach showed well in the first half. Tony Brosnan was lively in the second. Nice to see Mike Breen back in green and goal, too. He missed all of last season with a nasty hamstring injury. So uh, Limerick beat Watford 4-14 to 0-9, also in the McGrath Cup. Watford have had huge problems in terms of trying to get people to... To get involved with the panel this year, so I imagine it's going to be a long enough season for them. Uh, the old Burn Cup, then, that was Ray uh, Dempsey's first game as well, Shane. His first mm. game as an inter county manager. Um, I think Anthony Maher's involved as coach there as well. Um, Callum Keyes did a piece, piece in the Independent the other day, it's fascinating. He went down through every backroom team in football. Jesus, when you go through some of them, like there's some amount of uh, inter I think there's two inter county managers, all Ireland winning managers involved in backroom teams, like uh. Pat Gilroy, Sean Boylan, you go down into other backroom teams, like the strength and depth and the level and calibre of personnel that's involved. And I'm not talking about necessarily manager or coach. It's it's unbelievable, really. And it just shows you where the inter-county game has gone and the calibre of people that, you know, a lot of the top managers feel that they need around them. It's no longer, you know, me, you and another fella. You know, it's got it. Like it's a, a list of length of your arm now and everybody is bringing a different kind of expertise to the table it's it's mad it's mad really when you think about it when you think of where it's gone from to what it is now yeah so the, the O'Burn cup we'll look at the results there wexford beat oh sorry we're beaten by kildare 11 points to 118 loud 18 westmead nine points so a nice little win there for mickey hart and co leash 13 points longford 318 so that's a significant win there carlo 19 mead 16 points 
Uh, Wicklow, nine points, Dublin, 215. And it had a bit of a development feel to that Dublin squad, which is probably a little bit of a concern for Ushin McConnell. Not that he expects to be beating Dublin or even their second team this year. But, um, like, Desi Farrell wasn't even in... Like, it basically was a development panel. He wasn't on the sideline. Yeah, pretty much. Um, just a couple of points to note. Uh, there was no Jack McCaffrey. He played that kind of divisional, uh, was it the Dave Hickey uh, tournament earlier on mm. before Christmas, but didn't feature the other day. There was none of the Crocs contingent, obviously, including Paul Mannion. So neither of those two big returnees were playing. And Desi Farrell wasn't even listed in the match programme as the manager. So Ger Lyons, who's a former minor boss and under-20 selector, was listed as manager for the night, although Desi was there on the sideline. Uh, the biggest name probably on show was probably Colin Bascal. Um, definitely the most recognisable name, Anya, with the likes of Brian O'Leary, who saw a bit of championship action last year. And I think CJ Smith played a bit of the league. But they had a very development squad look to it. And listen, that's always been the way. Even when Dublin were winning all Ireland's, it was... Um, didn't, uh, didn't Paul Clark take charge of a, a yeah. Dublin team during the during the O'Byrne Cup before? I think they won it with development development squad one year when they were really in their pomp and when the talk of splitting Dublin in four was really at, at the height. But uh, I think just even on Colin Bascal, I think it's so important to have players like that back on board. He might not necessarily be a starter, but where Dublin were really caught, I would have said, in 2021 and even in last year, was the calibre of guys that were coming in to close out the game. Where it, where it was a Michael Darren McCauley or a Bernard Brogan or a Kev McMenamin or a Dermot Connolly or someone like that, that level definitely dropped. So, Pascal, I'm sure, will be pushing for a starting spot. But having someone like him to come in for 20 minutes, like he can kick two or three points. He can do have a game change in moment. So, I think it's great to have someone like him back involved. Um, yeah, and then just, it only straightens their deck a bit more, you know? Yeah, and even just to talk about Mead, who, as I said, beat Carlo 16 points to 1-9. wasn't a vintage performance, um, but Colin O'Rourke has his first, if you want to call it a competitive victory, as manager of the Royal County. He had seven debutants. Now, it wasn't brilliant, and in the end, they sort of pulled clear. It's still important for him to get a victory, uh, even if it's not the most convincing, because it just kind of sets things in the right motion, and he can go into the dressing room and say, look, lads, it wasn't brilliant. We're in heavy training, but we've come down here to Dr. Cullen Park, and we've got a victory. Uh, I think so, Shane. If you're talking about, we kind of mentioned earlier, how important is it to get a win? I think when there's a general apathy in a county and people are not, I don't think it's a, a big departure to say that people are not, like the whole county is not necessarily behind the senior football squad. Like you're living there. Do you, do you kind of get that sense that maybe people are even more interested in club than they are county? Well, I I see more Dublin jerseys going around Dunboyne than I do, than I do me jerseys. And that's just the way things are at the moment. But, uh, if you talk to anybody with their finger on the pulse here in the county, they will say there's a general apathy towards football in the county and towards the county side. And not been smart at you, um, the ladies' football squad and their successes dominate the narrative in Mead at the moment. And that's just the, that's the way it is. So I think Colm, uh, I think Colm O'Rourke will, will try and hit the ground running as much as he, as much as he possibly can. Now, what now what he has. Whether he has the caliber of player to work with to make a real impact or not, I, I'm not so I'm not so sure really. When you go down through, like you go down through the county final last year, it was a lot of, uh, say, elder, more experienced players that were the ones that were the real difference maker in some of the big club games in me this year. So it's going to be interesting to see what Colin O'Rourke can unearth. Um, but you know what? Fair play to him. He he wanted it two or three times before, didn't get it. Uh, there were probably more favourable times to get the Mead job than now, but he stood up, and you can say the same about Ushi McConville as well, going into Wicklow. It's not like maybe the most attractive post, but they've, you know, they've taken themselves off the the cosy seat up in up in Donnybrook, and they've uh, put themselves on a you know a miserable sideline at this time of the year. Like they're poles apart, they really are, from being an armchair pundit to actually putting yourself in the fire line like they are. And I was chatting to Eamon O'Hara before Christmas, and he just said, like, you will have some amount of lads like shouting and bawling during league games, oh, get back to RTE or whatever if things aren't going right. That's just the nature of it. Um, wasn't there someone, was it in GA? Wasn't he, wasn't he in Griffin spat on, I think, before? I think he was. In his first year as Wexford manager in 95, he nearly didn't come back in 96, I think. Was there a vote or something? And then they end up winning the All-Ireland in 96. It's gas. Um, actually, just speaking of things that happened as well, uh, somebody had up 
it was was it Timmy Hammersley or someone had it up. Eamon Cregan's rant against the media after they beat Cork in the championship. Do you remember that? What what was the fire to this performance? The media they wrote us off. We started talking about articles in the Cork Examiner and all this kind of crack. But that's that's a that's a, a brief aside. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the McKenna Cup. Uh, Monaghan, they lost it down 12 points to 10, so that's Conor Laverty. With little shades of the kill coup uh, in that one of those goals they scored, uh, getting off to a win and start. Tyrone beat Fermanagh 17 points to 1 7, and Armagh beat Antrim 220 to 2 8. I'm nearly sure I saw a tweet somewhere saying that there was 4,500 people at this game. Now, Andy McEntee obviously be disappointed with that result, but. Uh, like, I, I honestly think that in Ulster, the GA fans are probably more fanatical than anywhere else. Yeah, somebody I saw the same tweet. Somebody said the boom is back. That's all That's all I remember reading. And it was over 4,000 for McKenna Cup game. They've had, like, the goods of 8,000 for McKenna Cup finals with Tyrone and Armand and that yeah. in recent years. I remember during Sean Kavanagh's career, towards the latter stages, he played, I think they played a McKenna Cup final with huge crowds. They absolutely love it up there they absolutely love it and particularly like there's a lot of people i'd have fell on to me the other night looking for a link to the stream for waterford and tipperary like a walsh cup game he's not from either of the counties but it's just there is a big thirst for it at this time of the year because you've been denied it for so long and the christmas and eating turkey and eating whatever else and drinking whatever else there is a time you get sick of it or whatever and you just want to get back to normality and a lot of time ga is normality for people getting to a match watching a game or whatever so yeah it's great to have it back yeah i i felt i'd overdone christmas on december the 12th i looked the calendar and i was already <laughs> overdone it and i think as the month was going long i was the old love handles were growing throughout and uh, i didn't even go out new year's i was so done i was in bed by 10 o'clock that new night. year's is the most overrated night of the year anyway it's a disaster of a night generally yeah. um so what about ones to watch for 2023 about hurling and football who's coming to mind for you ones to watch um i have a little uh did i have a little bit I had a couple. I thought I had a couple. I thought I had a right, couple. Right, let me go first. So yeah, I go you go first. first. Now, I'm going to say, because of the, the problems they had between the sticks last year, at times, Connor Flaherty could be a real option for Galway this year. Now, he played in goals for the Sigerson final, played outfield uh, in the Fitz final in Hurling, uh, plays football for Clare Galway as well. So he's a bit of a sweeper-keeper vibe. I think he could be a real option for Galway this year and maybe something to bring him on to that next level. Uh, well, they definitely did have goalkeeping problems last year. Uh, well, I don't know if it was problems, but it was definitely, it was definitely, uh, I would say, an easy stick to beat Galway with, even though they didn't concede not a goal in the All Ireland final. There was probably a couple of points maybe that came, you know, directly or indirectly from straight kickouts or whatever. So it's going. They have plenty of competition there for that spot anyway. There's absolutely no doubt. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, as regards uh, a one to watch. We we saw we saw a bit of them this year, and the bits we saw are in twenty twenty two, and the bits we saw were really really good, uh, like the league final. But I didn't realize after that league hurling final that Carrick Daly had a stress fracture in his ankle and actually played all summer with that injury and went over and played Father Tom's over in Boston with that injury and came back and played uh, for Liz Moore with that injury as well. But I believe he's back fully fit now. And he's someone I t I really liked what I saw in that league final last year. Dara Fitzgibbon came into that league final absolutely flying, probably the player of the league. And I just think if Carrick Daly stays fit, and I'm talking about for a good period of time over the next seven or eight years, he's a player that could light it up for Walford because he's just so dynamic, uh, explosive pace. Maybe not going to be a big scorer from wing back or midfield, but just, yeah, I, I just I couldn't get, I was blown away by that league final performance last year. I think if he, is able to be consistent and be fit this year. I think he'd be a huge weapon for Watford. And how much of that is down to his Bursley blood, do you think? <laughs> actually, that came up. We interviewed him before Christmas, and that actually came up, um, surprisingly enough. His mother's from Bursley, isn't she? Mm. Yeah. Asher, listen. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I actually I said that, and he, he said his, his mother always said that that's where the hurling came from, from him and Erla. But listen, he, I think he begs to differ. Uh, his, his uncles were serious hurlers. Um, okay, uh, let's see. What's the? Oh yeah. So get your comments in and let us know who you think the ones are to watch out for this year. I'm going to give you my hurling one now, and you're you've been you've been coming down hard on Tipperary all the time here. So I'm going to say a big positive this year is going to be Brian O'Mara. He's obviously still hurling with UL. Uh, I think this could be a big year for him. There are other hurlers, the likes of Adam English. He might make a burst this year. 
Shane Meehan. But we've kind of seen, to some degree, we've seen Shane Meehan a little bit already. But Adam English, maybe Billy Drennan is another one that we might see a little bit this year with Kilkenny. But I'm going to go with Brian O'Mara. Brian O'Mara is a player. He is a serious talent. Uh, and him and Kieran Connolly opting out last year kind of further sucked a bit of uh, air out of the, the Tipperary balloon before anything had started. Connolly is back in with Tip Connolly's Connolly back in with Tipperary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he had an injury, but I'm hoping that he's over that now at this stage. Yeah, very good player as well. Brian O'Mara is brilliant. The two of them were outstanding for UL in the Fitzgibbon Cup last year. So uh, I think they're two serious players to have back on board. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll go al I'll go along with that. And I think they'll be, like, they're young. They're very, obviously very talented. They're very mobile, very fit. They're, they're the typical Liam Cal players that he can build around, I'd say, for the coming years. Yeah, Richard Hogan asks, actually, who played at, uh, at three for Watford on Tuesday night? This was against Tipperary. Uh, Mark Fitzgerald of Passage. Now, he was he's a player that, thankfully, when we were playing UC, UL with the Freshers last year, he was, I think, he had, well, not thankfully he had an injury, but thankfully he wasn't available because we would have been hammered by even more that day. But he was really impressive. He came up from the back and scored a beauty of a point at one stage. Shane McNulty was in the full back line and Connor uh, Ryan of Rowan Moore. They were also in the back line there. So, did you give your one to watch for football? Uh, no, I took it as a hurling football. Carrock Daly would be my, my, my only one across the two of them. Right, okay, you were too windy. Uh, comeback player of the year? Uh, there's a couple here. On the hurling front, um, Ocean Kelly was a massive loss for Offaly last year. Um, did his cruciate in club training, I think. Uh, I never got to play at all across this year. I haven't been the Christy Ring Cup player of the year. He'll be a huge one coming back for Offaly. Uh, from a Waterford point of view, Irla Daly as well, who I rate very, very highly, is a, a real utility player from two to and seven. And is that because Ms. Burris to leave blood? We had a comment in there saying that Dan McCormick's mother is from Calais uh, in County Cork. She played on the same Camogie team as Seamus Harnsey's mother. There you go now. John, she gave me math grinds. There you go. There yeah. you go now. Uh, a couple yeah, of other players. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of other players that I like. Um, obviously, they're going to have a big impact. Like, it's not too often that a team that wins the All Ireland has a two time hurler of the year coming back that barely, like, saw hardly any action uh, across all competitions with his county. But Keen Lynch is obviously going to be back. And then you have an All Star forward coming back as well in Peter Casey. Um, and we saw that he was kind of somewhat back to himself playing for Napierschig so he's going to be uh, a huge one coming back um, a couple of other ones as well um, what your man Seamus Callanan saw no chance did he, did he barely played league even last year did he who Seamus Callanan uh, he played yeah a little bit just a little yeah. bit not that so much like, He's like he's a huge player for Tipperary to have coming back in as well. And yes, I, I knew that that was uh, the home of Jodine as well. Obviously, one of the greatest forwards of all time, Hille and County Cork. Uh, yeah, Jack says David Blanchfield at Kilkenny. He's a big uh, player, to, one to watch this year. I suppose he yeah. kind of announced yeah. himself certainly during the league. I'm nearly sure at the end of the league, wasn't Eddie Brennan tweeting that he was his Kilkenny player at the league? Yeah, he played, he, play, he played the whole league. And uh, geez, I think he might have started one championship game. Uh, but he played very little championship action after. Dara Corcoran uh, is another one, I think. I think he'd be wing back for Kilkenny this year, um, mm. especially based on his club form. And he was in around there last year. I think he could be a huge player for them. Imagine having two big, athletic, mobile, strong wing backs, Blanchfield one side, Corcoran the other side, potentially. No, then the thing is, like, turning them the other way. If you have lads who are six foot four, then they just have to, you know, that's something that those players will have to very much be able to Funny you say to. that, because one, one of my wish lists was I was going to put down is that Limerick defenders are forced to play on the back foot and are turned facing their own goal. Because it just, like, and you have to admire them. It just doesn't happen. They manage, systematically, they manage to prevent it from happening. And it's, it's from their point of view, it's absolutely fantastic. Because you've played there, I've played there. When you're facing your own goal, you are in trouble. But it's so rare that, they are forced to do it, and you have to you have to laud them for that. Yeah, ML89 says Aidan McCarthy back for Clare after a horror injury is huge. People forget he was uh, by far Clare's best outside Tony Kelly in 2021. Don't think Clare will get out of monster though, and if they do, they won't go much further. So my comeback players of the year uh, in football, Ian Burke. So he's back in with Galway, hasn't played with them in over two years. He's expected to line out against Leitrim on Friday in the Air Dome. 
Uh, last played, I think, in November 20, November 2020. That was during the winter All-Ireland run um, when Mayo beat them in the Connacht final. Darren McVitie, I'm interested to see if he's back in with Cav and obviously played with Crosser Lock last year after being away. Mickey uh, Graham will certainly be looking to lure him back in. And Colin Reardon, obviously, if he, if he goes back in with Tipperary, assuming that the hip injuries aren't too much of um, an issue for him. Then on the, foot, on the hurling side of things, obviously, Keen Lynch, Peter Casey, Pat Ryan, all of those could feature. Obviously, the first two were injured last year. Uh, Seamus Callan, who you mentioned. And I don't, would you, could I say comeback player for Richie Hogan? Because obviously, I'm sure he feels he could have got more game time in the last year or two. And there's a chance for him to, you know, you mentioned TJ Reid going out on top. Maybe it could happen for Richie Hogan, who's obviously been one of the brilliant players the last 15 years. Yeah, potentially as well. I'd throw this to you. Can I put my, my comeback player for football as Conor Callaghan? Even he though he, play, he played a load of 20, I, I, no, he didn't play a load in 2022. He played no league. And, but when he played in championship, he was outstanding. But at the end of the day, his presence or lack thereof was the difference in the result in the All-Ireland semi-final. And Kerry mightn't have, been, mightn't have been celebrating had he been there. So I just hope to God that he stays fit the whole year because it makes the championship, it makes everything so much more interesting. Yeah, Richard Hogan mentions Colin Fenley there. Remains to be seen. Like, if he plays the All-Ireland final, Derek Ling throws out the... Puts up the bat signal. Don't think it's happening. Don't think it's happening. I believe he's going travelling after it, but you just you just never know. Things things change so quickly. Like um, Joey Holden was supposed to be gone, and he's back, and now has a chance to. That, like um, the club final could be Joey Holden's last game of senior hurling, realistically, because he's going to he plans to go off for two to three years. He'd be probably 34, 35 when he comes back. Um, Colin. By all accounts, it seems to be that Colin is um, Colin is going travelling after. So if he was able to coax him back, he'd be some addition to have. Mm, certainly would. And the All Ireland Club semi finals they're on this weekend. Kilmacud will meet Karen's O'Reilly. That's Croke Park one thirty on Sunday. And Moy Cullen will meet Glenn. That's the game afterwards. That's at three thirty p.m. So for Kilmacud, I think most people will be expecting this to go the way of Kilmacud. Obviously got to the All-Ireland final last year, had it all but one going into the final seconds when Kilku took it out from under their noses. Haven't won it since 2009. I did an interview with Andrew McGowan, which is up on the channel as well. He's wing back for Crokes and, and he was very good talking all about their season and coming back from where they were. But, I mean, Paul Mannion, he's been back in doing a bit of light training. Not sure he's going to be ready for this one. A lot will fall on Shane Walsh as well, but they have a host of other good forwards, the likes of... Shane Cunningham, uh, Tom Fox, who I, I don't think has been starting the last couple of games, uh, Hugh Kenny, and so on and so forth. There's a, and Dara, Dara Mullen as well. A lot of really good players there. Hard to make a case really for for Karen Zorahli winning this game, even if they do have some quality. Uh, I think it is realistically just on Mannion. Uh, just from what I was reading the other day, it seems to be like his mate. He'd love to get back to play with Kilmacud, but I don't think they're going to be rushing him. Um, and the main priority, I think, is fitness for Dublin at this stage. It's one thing to say he's back jogging, uh, but he's not, I don't think he's done any of the training with the squad. And I don't think that, I don't know if that'll be much different uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Obviously, came back from a serious enough injury. He's been out, what's he been out? The guts of about three months at this stage? -ish. Probably, yeah. You know, so I don't know. Um, listen, he'd be a great lad to have back, even off the bench, if they did have him for an All Ireland club final. And realistically, Shane, like, I. Like this is a this is a fairly a landslide victory for for Crokes really, like and well landslide for them could be eight, like a landslide for them could be eight or nine points, but just to have them really at arm's length the whole way through. Um, what did Karen Zorahli score in the Munster final? Was it like two five or was it two five to one seven or something like that in the Munster final? Like they're they're I, I, well they're not going to see the color of the goal chances that they did against Newcastle West. Um, I, I don't expect Jack Savage to be given the freedom he was at different times uh, in that Munster final. He won't be able to dictate affairs. Um, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Rory O'Carroll dropped back on, on Tommy Walsh if he had to, if they were going to go with that aerial bombardment like they did in that in the Munster final, which got them an awful lot of joy. Um, and you know it's going to be fascinating? Craig Diaz and David Moore in the middle of the field. I was thinking that, yeah. yeah. Moore really dominated the second half against Newcastle West. He was like he was just seemed to be everywhere. He was under a bit of pressure in the first half. They were marking him quite tightly and really getting in his face. But he it was like the big man in the middle of the field dominated. The big man in the edge of the square dominated. But like 
Diaz the best club player in the country at the moment? Is, is he or is he not? Uh, and if if they do get to the final and it's the Glenn in the final, you have another dream match of him and Connor Glass potentially in the final as well, which would be brilliant. But um, and I I just think yeah I, I think Kilmacud are going to be so hard beaten in this really do I think they're I think they're a couple of levels above Cairns or Ali's if I, if I'm honest. Yeah, it was two six to one eight in that monster final. I agree with you. I do think that they'll. Yeah, but like I do look at some of the Kearns Rally players and think, you know, Karma Coffey, he's kind of, I think he's been in and around the Kerry panels in recent times. Obviously, David Moore, who you've mentioned, Jack Savage, Gavin O'Brien's been in there, Barry John Keane, obviously, Tommy Walsh. The last kick he had in anger in competitive action at Croke Park was that late shot looking for an equalizer against Tyrone in the All Ireland semi final in 2021. He'll obviously looking to be making an impact. But I suppose the thing is, normally teams don't get a chance to isolate a full back against Kilmacud Crokes. Yeah. They're so good at managing games and sort of boxing teams in. Like I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with the with the Karen Zarahli kick out here and how Crokes will manage to box yeah. them in because they're so good at that. And then obviously Shane Walsh is such a, a game changer at the other end. I think Mike Cullen against Glenn is a very tasty game. Like Glenn obviously did so brilliantly to beat Kilku and dethrone him as All Ireland champions in the Ulster final. But um, Mike Cullen are obviously a very good side. They've won two of the last three county titles in Galway. And this is going to be a physical game. And some of the players will know each other from the Galway Derry All Ireland semi final also. Yeah, this is a fascinating game. And it's probably the game of the weekend. The preseason games are grand, but whether to be skin and hair flying is another thing. Uh, this game is, like, you would you would probably fancy Glenn to come through uh, in the heat of the hunt, as you'd say yourself. But my Cullen, my Cullen have had a couple of blips, right? Um, the couple of blips was a stroke sound, random, really, really close. Then I thought they were clinical enough against Torla Strand and, you know... Westport. Yeah, West, and Westport, yeah. I think it was Westport and stroke sound, but they were, they've been... They got that kind of blip out of the way and were able to get through it. And uh yeah, I think they'll fancy themselves going into the going into this weekend. Um, as I said, Peter Cook has been based in Galway a bit longer. Desi Keneally was brilliant throughout the whole kind of campaign, and obviously the Galway campaign as well. They've a good handful of Galway panelists or former Galway panelists, the good to about five or six all told. Um that's this this is the game of the weekend, but you'd have to say when you look at the level that Glenn got to against Kilku, like that, particularly that second half of that game was like, you know, we've talked about Bally Gunner and the Piercy taking club hurling to another level. Like that was another level of club football that we haven't probably seen in a while, I would say. And they were able to break down Kilku and break them down emphatically enough in the second half. Never, never trailed in that game, actually. We're ahead from start to finish. Got that brilliant goal at the end as well. Um, I fancy, I, I think, like, Glenn have not um, been unbelievable from start to finish in games. Ergil Kieran led them, remember. They uh, struggled against Carrigan at stages as well. But I, I fancy them just to find a way, especially having that the Kilku monkey off the back and having the Ulster monkey off the back as well. Yeah, and I think the likes of Conal uh, McGuckey and Danny Tallon, um, obviously Emmett Bradley as well. They've got a lot of players there, and Michael Warnock, who we interviewed during the week as well, lads who know how to get stuck in in these big championship games. They've had a nice bit of time since the 11th of December to sort of celebrate a first-ever Ulster title and go again. Richard Hogan says, uh, sure, uh, should both senior club football semi-finals have been played before Christmas and one in line with the senior hurling, given that both finals are on the same day? Um, you could make a case for it, I mean... Yeah, I, w I wouldn't argue the toss too much on that one. Never, uh, oh, sorry, that's a, I haven't read that comment yet. Mike Collins' best games have been against the better teams. Hammered Mount Benue and Westport. Struggle against poor teams then. Fancy Mike Collins to keep Connacht's great record against Ulster going. I'm kind of leaning, tw leading to, uh, leaning towards Mike Collins myself, actually. Really? The big man who had Glenn Tipp to win the All-Ireland la last year. Number one yeah. in the power rankings. Yeah, the very the same lad. I Stapleton mean, then abandons Glenn. This will be this will just feed into the narrative that they have about people questioning their character and their manhood, um, and write them off. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, but like you said, they have the likes of De uh, Desi Keneally, um, Owen Gallagher. Obviously, the Antrim man is involved there. David Wayne apparently really drives standards there also, and mentioned Peter Cook, one of the nicest kickers of a football going. Then you've got uh, Sean Kelly as well. So there's, there's an awful lot of quality in that team, and I think plenty of them are built for Croke Park also. Now, at the same time, I'd, I'd say it's going to be a kick of a ball between the teams at the end of it. Imagine there was um, another Malie style. Obviously, it's it's Galway versus Derry. Sean Kelly was in the middle. Was he sent off after that Malie wrongly? 
wasn't he sent off? Um, I'm just thinking as well, he's had some year. Um, he's the only one that was able to get the better of David Clifford as well this year when they won the Sigerson as well. He's had an unbelievable year. That's season, I should say, that's still rolling along. Yeah, I actually, I interviewed him as well, which you can also get on the channel there, or our game.ie, and I was asking him about who's the toughest player to mark that he's marked, and he's marked some of the big ones, so go and check that out if you want to find out. You know, the man for the clickbait. I'm mad, I'm mad to find out now. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know what? No, I don't give it out for nothing. Do you? <laughs> hey, you won't go and buy the milk if I give you, wait now. You won't buy the cow if I give you the milk for free. We'll put it that there way. You go. There you uh, go. The All Ireland Intermediate Football Semi Finals: Dunmore McHale's will of Galway will be, meet Galbraith Pierce's of Tyrone. Saint Mogues Feathered or Feathered, as you would say, are against Ratmore of Kerry. Junior Semi Finals will see Clifton of Galway against Stewartstown Harps of Tyrone and Castletown of Mead meet Bossa of Kerry. I'd say it'd be a fair turnout in Port Leash for that. Well, I was thinking about going down to it. There's so many games on. I don't know why they put every game on at the same time, particularly when some grounds have uh, floodlit pitches. There's so many games. I'd go to two games if I could, if they were at different times. Everything nearly seems to be on the same time on Saturday. But I'd nearly be tempted down to Port Leash. It's probably that or, it's probably that or Michal Donoghue's debut in Dublin. And I'm down in Callan for Kilkenny and Offaly on Sunday. Um, but I'd say, yeah, Asher, listen, fa- like, it's amazing... It's not his own entourage, but the entourage that Clifford brings with him brings with him everywhere around the country. It's phenomenal. I haven't seen anything like it. I haven't really seen anything like it before across any GA court. Yeah, he's like Jay Z going around with the with the entourage or something like that, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking Tupac, that's who I was actually thinking. Uh, the FBD League, I already kind of mentioned it, Leitrim are against Connacht, that's in the Air Dome this weekend. O'Byrne Cup, West Mead will meet Wexford, Kildare, Louth, Mead Leash, Longford against Carlow, and Offaly will do battle with Wicklow. The McGrath Cup sees Watford meet Tip and Kerry against Clare. The Kenna Cup has Down Donegal for Manaby, Derry, and Antrim will meet Cavan. And I think that's kind of more or less the height of it now, isn't it? We've yeah, said I, it. I didn't do my predictions for the football. Um, the football will be Tyrone to win Ulster, Galway to win Connacht, uh, Dublin to win Leinster, Kerry to win Munster, and Dublin to take back Sam. And I mean, last year is, is uh, St. Mogues versus Ratmore fixed for Mallow or Dungarvan? I'm down for Parky Rin here. Yeah, give me two seconds and I, give me two seconds and I'll find out. Um, a lot of these games have been changed. There's so many venues at the moment that just can't take you know whether it's traffic or whether it's rain or whatever and they're really really struggling which game is it Shane? Uh, Moogs against Ratmore Moogs against Ratmore is down for Parky Rain I have as well yeah so yeah, yeah. we're right. hardly well, one of us could be wrong but we're rarely both of us are wrong well okay well that's it for the show today um, tune in again on Monday we'll be back reviewing all of the weekend's action if you haven't watched it live do get your comments in we'll try and reflect that on why do you have a big smirk on your face no because you're going to have because you're going to be beardless on Monday and I'm looking forward to it you look like a different man you look like a boy yeah, I know I know. and uh, don't forget to support uh, our store that if you need to get any of the official our gate merchandise that's the place to go and we'll have it up on the screen there in a second Michael chat to you on Monday cheers Shane